Good evening and welcome to the MCPS Board of Trustees meeting. For those of you joining via Zoom, here are a few tips about how to use Zoom. If you move your cursor to the bottom of your screen, you'll notice that there are two icons. One says mute and one says start or stop video. These will allow you to control what people can see and hear from you during the board meeting. We are going to keep everyone muted until the point when you are need to make your public comment. In the center of the screen, you will see an icon for chat. We have chat disabled for public comment. The board meeting, you will only be recognized when you raise your hands and you'll be picked upon your turn. You will also notice there's an icon that says participants. Click on that and a white window will open on your screen. If you scroll to the bottom of that white window, you will see a button for raise your hand. This is how you'll raise your hand and be acknowledged to make public comment. Individuals who have raised their hands will be listed in the participants area and we will call on you in the order that you appear on that list. If you're calling into the board meeting and you wish to make a public comment, press nine to raise your hand and six to mute, unmute yourself. I'll turn it over to Chair Lorenzen to start the meeting now. Hey, thank you, Paul. And Paul will be managing the Zoom. I'm not gonna attempt to do that. So we'll just, it, it, we'll just rely on that, on him. So our uh, first order of business is uh, roll call. And we have all trustees present. We have Ann Wake and Jen Vogel on the Zoom. Everyone else in the room, with the exception of Vicki McDonald, unless she's on the Zoom. No sign. So it's those, that's our, our quorum. We have a quorum of both parts of the board. So if we could rise and say the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, item three on the agenda, on the agenda is to review, revise, and approve the agenda. Uh, you'll notice it's slightly different than in the past. There are more items in consent agenda than previously put in there. Um, so I would just ask if, if you have anything you want pulled out, we'll, you can do it now or you can do it when, when we get there, but they're, they're the usual items. The other thing that's different, you'll see in the other topics, I've added, we've added a item for board discussion and it falls between the presentation from either administration or some other presenter and the point at which we make a motion. So it, we're gonna kind of relax our adherence to Robert's rules of order. We're gonna go ahead and have some discussion. You can ask questions to the presenters and then t discuss and ask more questions. It, it'll free us up a little bit. Once a motion is made, you're still free to have as much board discussion as you like. So. That's a slight change to the agenda for this time. Um, so item four on page five, we have the, the, me, the minutes of the regular meeting from May 11th, 2021. Um, are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? Seeing none, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? <laughs> Moved by Trustee Deck. Did you wanna say something? Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. So it's a question about the new agenda format. Uh -huh. And just wondering if there will be any kind of time limit or if the board will call for a motion at a particular time, like if there's any, or are we just gonna kind of try it and see how we go? I think we'll try it. I think, I think if the board begins to coalesce around a motion, someone can make a motion. Okay. We just, we just will allow ourselves to, to discuss ahead of the motion, cool. which it just I might be more useful to us. Thank you. Anne has a comment. Anne, go ahead. I don't have a problem. I'm just, just going to second the motion. Oh, okay. So motion by Grace, <laughs> seconded by Anne Wake. Uh, any discussion? Any board discussion? Any public comment? So all trustees in favor of approving the minutes, please signify by raising your hand. And that is- Vogel is yes. Thank you. Oh, and Vicki McDonald is here now, Tracy. So that's unanimous as to all of trustees present. So we have a full quorum of the nine of us. Um, 
So agenda item number five is uh, public comment and correspondence. Um, we have written correspondence in the agenda, be in the packet beginning on page 10. And so now is the period when we would accept public comment regarding non-agenda items. Um, no? Oh, Paul's not seeing any public comment on non-agenda items. Okay, thank you. Um, and then agenda item six, we have reports and announcements. Um, the health insurance trust fund report is included in the packet, um, starting on page 19. And if you have questions about that, you could ask them, I guess, to the administration later. And then B is announcements from the superintendent and C is announcements from the chair. Okay, go ahead, Rob. All right, thank you, Chair Lorenzen. I have uh, just uh, some end of year events that I just wanted to remind the board about. We do have graduations coming up June 4th. Um, actually, June 3rd in the evening is Willard's and then June 4th, uh, uh, let's see, Big Sky is first at nine, Hellgate is at noon and Sentinel is at three. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in attending those, please make sure you let Tracy know. We just wanna make sure we have a spot for you on the stage. Um, those will happen at the uh, Washington Grizzly Stadium. And so what you'll do is you'll just meet me down on the field um, once you get there. It doesn't really matter where you park at, but just meet me down on the field by the stage. Um, and if you can come about uh, 15, minute, 15 to 20 minutes before, that would be great. Um, the Sealy graduation is on June 6th, which is that Sunday at one o'clock. Um, I know there's a few board members going uh, but be sure to let Tracy know if you're going to go to that one as well. Uh, just a couple of other end of year announcements. So the last day of school for students is June 9th. Um, and the last day for eighth graders is actually on June 8th. So rather than doing a, a formal eighth grade um, ceremony for each middle school, they're doing an eighth grade celebration at each school um, on June 8th. And so that'll be the last day for eighth graders. That's all the announcements I have. Um, thank you, Rob. So I, I just had a few things. I think one was simply that the agenda is a, a little bit uh, changed. Although we're supposed to follow Robert's rules of order in general, we don't have to follow it strictly. Uh, some of the differences are uh, the board is required to vote on a, on a school board because we're elected. Um, and the other is, you know, we kind of say you're not allowed to abstain. But that's not strictly true. You can, but we really discourage it because again, you're elected. And if someone feels like they don't have enough information to make a decision, that means maybe we didn't discuss long enough. So again, we discourage abstaining unless it's a, there's a personal involvement in the issue. Um, we've, we've removed voicemail. We've had voicemail boxes since way back, but they don't work. They often don't work. And so Tracy checked and it's not required that we have voicemail. So from now on, there won't be the board voicemail boxes. You'll get emails uh, strictly. So that's kind of a relief. I don't think mine ever worked or I couldn't figure it out. Um, so, and then uh, we're all members of the Montana School Boards Association. So you should be getting emails from the MTSBA. And, and if you're not, let Tracy know. Um, they should be coming to your Gmail account, uh, your board account. Um, so, that's what I had for board for announcements. Any questions? All right, thanks. Um, item seven of the agenda is the consent agenda. And as I mentioned, we've moved more things here, things that we that are pretty routine. We still have things that are elementary only and things that are full board. And so if we could uh, have an elementary trustee uh, make a motion that we approve item 7A2, 74A, and 6. Those are elementary only items. Uh, is there such a motion? Moved by Trustee of Garris. Is there a second? Second by Trustee Mercer. Um, any board discussion? I guess we don't discuss. Sorry? <laughs> this consent agenda. We do take public comment on consent agenda. No public comment. Um, so all trustees in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand. 
And that is unanimous to all trustees present. Um, and then on the consent agenda, the remaining items are 7A3, 7, excuse me. 7A1. Oh, sorry. Yep, 7A1, 7A3, 7-4-B, 5, and 7. Uh, so do we have a motion from any trustee to approve those items on the consent agenda? Sure. Uh, moved by Trustee Decker, second by Trustee Abgaris. Um, all trustees in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand. And that is unanimous. Our goal is yes. Thank you. That's unanimous as to all trustees present. Now we move to agenda item eight, new business. Um, the first item is a draft COVID response plan presented by Superintendent Watson. Okay, thank you, uh, Trustee Lorenzen, Chair, Chair Lorenzen. I have uh, <clears throat> just a few slides this evening, not a lot. I'd like to try to get through those if it's okay with everyone. And then if you have questions, um, we, could, we could do those after I get through the slides. Basically, I just wanna get everyone up to speed with um, the discussions we've been having at the district level, the discussions we've been having with um, staff across the district, as well as the discussion I had with the COVID task force uh, at the last meeting. So um, we, are, we are planning for next fall. Um, it's, it's important that we start this process early. Uh, a couple of things I would just say is we know that things may change and um, the, the plan is, is really a plan for the, plan for the best, but also um, if, if things change drastically, well, then, we'll have a, then we'll have a backup plan. But the plan you're gonna see this evening is, a, is hopefully planning for the best situation. Um, and then um, hopefully our plan is flexible enough that if things change, we can always go backwards. So uh, the first thing I wanna chat about is uh, this, uh, this idea of shifting into phase three. So um, back in January, when we made the decision to shift from phase one to phase two, so remember phase one was hybrid and phase two was uh, more students uh, more days a week. When we made the decision to make that shift, it was based on some guidance that we got um, not only from CDC, but also, if you recall, the, the Harvard um, uh, School of Public Health released some guidance in, in late December. So really, um, the COVID task force designed a, a process to make these decisions. And one of the things we, were, we would check was um, the sort of the community indicators. And so the incident rate and the test positivity rate of the community, if, if they were to remain low for several consecutive weeks, then it would imply that um, we could consider a shift to phase to the next phase. So checking that for the last several weeks, that has remained really low. The incident rate in Missoula County has been under 10 for many, many weeks, and the test positivity rate is, is under 5% for several weeks. So, the, that one, those both look really good in terms of this possible shift to phase three. The next thing, um, assuming the community numbers look good, the next thing we also consider are, are lots of district indicators, number of new cases, the active cases, the close contacts, transmission rates, like the percentage that it's being transmitted in school versus out of school, staff absences due to COVID, contact tracing, um, the time it takes us to contact trace, all of those things have really remained in the green zone for several weeks now. So they're all, they're all looking really good. So in terms of a shift to phase three, um, this, this, both of these indicators would, would imply that, that we're ready for a shift to phase three. So when we're thinking about next fall, that's, that's what we started with, the plan of starting off in phase three. And just uh, to remind everybody what phase three is, so phase three is more of a traditional school model and it's explained actually on page 29 of your agenda. Um, this actually came right out of our initial planning document from earlier this fall, but we really define phase three as sort of that traditional school model. And so um, on-site learning, more days every week, um, students rotate through their schedules and routines. Extracurricular activities would return 
uh, both at middle school and high school, but obviously there'd be mitigation strategies involved. And then we'd still maintain uh, the, the online academy for 100% virtual learning available for, for students or families if they so desire. So what I wanna do is just outline for the board kind of what, what's gone into this planning process and kind of where we're at. So um, the very first thing I just wanna let you know is that even though we might be moving into phase three, there will still be district supports and there'll still be mitigation strategies. So as I said before, the online academy is a district level support that we will continue to offer. Um, face coverings, the, the, the big unknown out there is face coverings. I would tell you that um, I have this flagged in here as to be determined. Uh, we're still uh, waiting for um, guidance from CDC. Their current guidance, they are still recommending face coverings in schools. The Montana, Montana Academy of Pediatrics supports that guidance as well. We received a letter from the Montana Academy of Pediatricians that support the CDC guidance. So as of right now, that's where we're at, but we anticipate that might change over the summer. So that's just a to be determined, the face coverings. Um, we'll have to make a decision on that no later than the first week of August. Uh, obviously cleaning and hand washing, I think those have really helped this year. Um, we've learned a lot about how to respond to positive cases. We have a whole team of folks now, including our nurses and our um, health supervisor and our district coordinator. We have a team of people that really do well at responding to positive cases and we'll continue that next year. Um, staffing wise, we wanna continue uh, with additional nursing staff as much as possible and, and permanent subs, I'll explain that in just a second. And then I'll, I just mentioned this, but this past year we had a district coordinator, uh, COVID coordinator, we're gonna continue that next year just to help respond um, to any possible positive cases. Something that uh, would be new next year is adding more intervention staff. This was a request from our, from our teachers, um, having that intervention staff, both ac academic interventions and social emotional supports, using some of our CARES Act money or our ESSER money to add that staff uh, would be critical next year. So something we're planning on. Um, testing protocol, we learned a lot this year about how to test for COVID and when it's appropriate to test for COVID and how to use testing in order to minimize um, infection spread or, or to, to control infection. So that'll continue next year as well, test it, the testing, COVID testing as needed. And then finally, vaccines. Uh, we don't have a lot of control over vaccines, but we can support access for those who want a vaccine. We did that this last week with a, a vaccine clinic that we partnered with a local pediatricians in town, we had almost a thousand uh, 12 to 15 year olds go through the vaccine clinic in just a couple of days last week. So that's something we can continue to support is access to vaccines for those who want those. Sorry, I don't know why I'm not going forward. There it goes. I'm going the wrong direction. All right, so uh, one thing that I continually heard this year when I was talking to the committee and talking to staff, I had a meeting last evening with um, K-5 staff and what I continually heard is they really wanna try to keep the things that worked well. Now, obviously this year was a tough year, but we actually learned a lot and there's some things that we learned that worked out really well. So they said, you know, even if we come out of COVID at some point, these are some things that we wanna keep um, and I thought that was pretty relevant. In fact, our COVID task force talked about this several months ago. One of the task force members said, let's try to learn from this and try to keep things that, that, that we learned that worked well. So obviously the online academy uh, as an option for students and families, we wanna keep that going for as long as we can. We'll have to, in the future, we're gonna have to worry about funding for that, but at least for next year, we can use our ESSER money to cover that. So that's something that is important. The permanent subs, which really the reason we did the permanent subs is because we didn't want substitutes going from building to building to building, um, but they, the staff really appreciated having permanent subs. So that's a sub that's tied to a school and is there all the time. They can start to build relationships with the kids and the families and the teachers. 
So the permanent subs is something the staff really felt um, was important to keep going. And we learned a lot about virtual meetings this year, um, especially around parent-teacher conferences, IEPs and 504s. Um, so having that as an option, we believe really helps families. And so it doesn't have to always be that way, but having it as an option, I think really does help families and our staff would like to see that continue. A couple of other things that we did this year that we've never done before is the common dismissal for K-5. So if you, if you have a K-5 kiddo, you'll remember pre-COVID that the younger kids got out at three and the older kids got out at 3.30 and it's really awkward for families to have multiple kids in the same school. And so this year we had a common dismissal for K-5 and it worked out really well. So that's something we wanted to try to continue. Obviously the later start time for high school, that's something that this board has talked about before. So I won't go into that, but we did do that this year and it, did, it was very beneficial. At K-5, we were actually, with, with some extra money, we were actually able to add some specialists. So we added art specialists at almost every school and that helps support our COVID mitigation strategies, but it's something that the teachers really appreciated having those extra specialists in the building. Um, at middle school and high school, uh, they really liked the block scheduling because it, it was fewer transitions during the day. The day seemed a little less hectic than, rather than going to seven or eight periods a day. So that's something that, um, that you'll see continuing as well in, in some, some spots. And then um, it was interesting last night, I heard from the K-5 teachers, a couple of things they really liked is potting at recess. So trying to keep kids in smaller groups at recess, actually cut down on the number of misbehaviors at recess. So that's something they'd like to continue, even though it may not be necessary in the future because of COVID, it, it's something they really thought was beneficial for the overall well-being of the school. They haven't, they, uh, several schools tried this open door policy in the morning so that when kids showed up at school, they just went right into the school rather than hanging out on the playground and then all coming in in one big group. That really helped cut down on a lot of things. They really liked that. It, it seemed a little more um, calm for kids when they were coming in. So that open door in the morning is something that they liked. Breakfast in the classroom. Some of our schools were already doing this, but. We, this really pushed all of our schools to do it this year and a lot of schools really liked that and they'd like to see that continue next year. The bonus of breakfast in the classroom is it's free for all kids, even in a non-COVID year. Um, as long as you do breakfast in the classroom, it's free for everybody. So that's, some, that's just an extra bonus. All right, so I'm just gonna go through the times, the proposed times and the schedules. So. We have uh, been working uh, quite a bit for the last, I would say, eight weeks or so, talking with um, our staff, talking with our, our transportation contractor, Beach Transportation. Here's the goals that I, I sort of set out for the times. Number one, I wanted to get back to the accreditation standard, which is 1,080 hours per year. So. Years and years ago, the requirement was 180 school days, but that changed several years ago. The requirement is actually 1,080 hours per year. And so I wanted to get back to that because obviously we didn't meet that this year with our shortened schedule. Um, later start time for high school is something that um, this board has talked about before. And so that's something that we wanted to try to work into the mix and then a common release time for K-5. Now, I'll just preface to say that these times are not perfect. We know that um, there are pros and cons to these, and um, they're, they're, not gonna work for, they're not gonna work for everybody, and we understand that. We believe it gets us a little bit closer to what our goals are, realizing that in the long run, um, we'll, try to, we'll try to make better time, make these times even better, but it, it's gonna take a little bit of planning and preparation and some coordination to do that. But let me go through the times and explain the differences and then um, I'll, I'll tell you what the next steps are. So K-5, we're at 8.15 to 3.15, middle school 7.50 to 2.45, high school 8.55 to 3.55. Obviously just looking at that, middle school is probably starting a little bit too early, high school is starting a little bit too late. But in order to make the busing work in the morning, that's kind of where, where we're at right now. I'll talk about that problem in just a second. 
the Thursday, um, we would go back to an early release schedule on Thursdays. Remember, the purpose of the early release is to provide teacher professional development and time for teachers to collaborate with each other, which is really important. So <clears throat> we'd have early release at K-5 and middle school. The high school wants to pilot a, a late start rather than an early release. I think it's a good idea um, for a lot of reasons. And so what you'll see there is just a subtle difference that um, the, high school's, the high school's early out is actually in the morning, so it's a late start. This really helped with busing times on Thursdays. This really helped improve our schedule with, for busing by having the high school on a, on a later schedule. So that was good. Uh, we're gonna assess these times throughout the year. We know that they're not ideal. Um, we will probably come back to you the following year and, and have even better times, but this is as best as we can get it right now. What I would tell you is that Beach Transportation has done a great job helping us sort through this problem. I, I believe they're, um, they've been very, very flexible. One of the things we did as an administration is we contracted with a third party called TransFinder, and TransFinder does this for uh, school districts across the country, and what they do is they look at the number of buses you have and the times you're proposing, and they'll, they'll be able to tell you how many buses it'll take to make those times work. And so just for example, when we moved to the middle school by five minutes, it added like six extra buses, which was unworkable. So the limits are, you know, Beach only has so many buses and so many drivers. And so there are some limits we have to live in. Uh, but the bonus is, is that TransFinder is gonna help us with efficiency studies over the next year to try to decide where we can gain some efficiencies in the schedule, where we might be able to share some routes and so we believe that with their help, the schedule will even get better in the future. And not to say that Beach um, also wasn't looking at this as well, but sometimes it takes that third eye to kind of look over the whole schedule and, and look for some efficiencies. So that's kind of where we're at with the times. The last thing I'll just show you is the, is the actual schedule itself. And, and you'll see some things in here that um, are a carryover from this year and some new things that we were, are really excited about. So, the K-5 would go back to a traditional schedule where lunch and recess would be pretty similar with the exception that recess will probably have some potting in it. Um, <clears throat> the specials like PE, library, music, and art, they would go back to a more normal rotation. This year, those folks were really limited in, in what they could do because we weren't really sending kids out of the classroom, but next year, the specials would go back to a more normal rotation. Um, at least for the next year, we'd like to try to hold on to the art specialists uh, because it really does help with the elementary schedule. Um, and um, Dave or, or Russ can describe to you if you have questions about what the elementary schedule looks like, but having that fourth special really helps um, run the whole elementary schedule. So it's something that, that we're excited about and hopefully we're able to build that into the future. The middle school, um, <clears throat> both, uh, all three middle schools noticed a significant change in student behavior when they were on that block schedule. The, the problem with the block schedule we had this year is it was an intensive block schedule. So you might have math for three weeks and then you may not have math again for another six weeks, which was a problem. What they're proposing, Meadow Hill and CS Porter are, want to pilot a modified block. And what that is is you're going you're gonna to see every class during a week but you may only have three or four classes a day. But by the end of the week, you will have visited all seven classes or eight classes. So they'd like to pilot that. They really saw the benefits of having uh, fewer transitions during the day. If you know anything about middle school kids, you know, the more times they transition during the day, it just creates that more, more of that chaos. And so they would like to pilot that. Um, Washington is returning to more of a traditional schedule, but I think it's just because they didn't want to jump on a block schedule right away. I think, I think we'll learn a lot this year from the two schools that are piloting this, and then we'll spend the next year deciding what, what really works for middle schools. The bonus of this schedule is that exploratories like music and art and those things, they will return to a more frequent rotation. I know one of the concerns we had this year is, you know, for a subject like band or world language, it doesn't really work if you only have it like once every six weeks. So the exploratories will go back to a more frequent rotation. The high schools are probably the one that I'm most excited about. We're, we're, all the high schools have, have agreed to be on the same schedule this next year. 
something that hasn't happened um, ever since Big Sky was opened. Um, so I don't know when that was, 1980, 84. So when Big Sky opened, that's when they all were, went to different schedules. Um, there's a lot of inefficiencies by having them on different schedules. So we hope to gain some efficiencies by having them on the same schedule. If you think about the programs they share, like Ag Ed or the Auto Program, it's very difficult for those programs to operate when they're, they're getting school, kids from three different schools on three different schedules. So we believe that'll help. We also believe that this will provide an opportunity for students um, to take classes that may not be at their school, especially if it's a virtual class. So now that we've learned some things about virtual education, it's possible that in the future, maybe not next year, but in the future we may be able to, a kid might be able to zoom into a class across town because they're all on the same schedule. Uh, the final thing that I really like about this schedule is the academic intervention. So it's a modified block schedule. So for Monday, Tuesday, and Friday, you're gonna go to all seven periods. But on Wednesday, you go to the odd periods, one, three, five, and seven. And on Thursday, you go to the even periods, two, four, and six. It leaves a little bit of time on Thursday, every single Thursday, where we actually built in an academic intervention and support period for all kids. So that's a really nice thing to have right in the middle of the week sort of slow things down. If a kid needs to make up a lab in a science class, they need to do a test in a different class, it just provides that period during the day where they can get some of that stuff done. So I'm excited about this schedule. The online academy, the MOA, also will be on this schedule. The reason is, is because you might have an MOA kid that would like to take a class at, the, at their home high school. And so having them on the same schedule will allow them to go back to their high school to take an elective class if they so desire. So having all of them on the same schedule is pretty exciting for us. Both Sealy uh, Swan and Willard are also piloting variations of a block schedule. The Sealy students really liked their schedule this year. They were on an intensive block schedule, so they're making some modifications to that, but they're pretty excited to also be piloting a block schedule next year. And I think that's all I had. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Um, so now's the time for questions or comments from the board. For Go ahead, Grace. Thanks. Um, thanks for all that information. What a ton of moving parts. There's so much to figure out about how all of these new things are going to fit together. Um, I am thrilled to hear about all of the, the positives of this year that are going to be, um, that we're going to work on keeping. I think that's great. Um, I think that's what a smart, strong, healthy learning school district should be doing. Um, and it also is such a positive to focus on the wins of this year instead of, as we have so often, the challenges. So yay, that's really great. Um, very excited. I am curious to hear about any strategies that we have in mind and are planning to spend any of the funding on around um, obviously it's a passion of mine, but the younger kids who are coming into the district and wondering about kids who maybe skipped their, uh, didn't attend kindergarten at all, um, stayed in their early childhood environments, um, parents who may be concerned about those kids coming into first grade. And then just in general for the younger kids who've been out of social situations, kind of what teachers are doing to prepare for those, like, cause they're gonna see a different set of behaviors that they might not expect in kids of a given age. Um, who would normally have some school under their belts, and this year they won't. And so I'm just, cons my concern would be, of course, that those kids would be considered to be, um, you know, have challenging behaviors, may end up with a label when really what they need is experience. So I'm just wondering how we're getting ready for all of that. Yeah, I, I've made note of that. We haven't necessarily gotten that far in the planning process, other than to tell you I know that our principals are really anxious to try to funnel some of the intervention, the extra intervention support at those younger grade levels, um, pre-K to second grade. So I know that they're, that's a topic that they're thinking about as well, but I, I haven't gotten to that level of planning. I don't know, Russ, if you've talked to the K-5 principals about that. Uh, we have talked about that, social emotional learning that's gonna be necessary to address. So uh, a couple weeks back, I asked the K-5 principals to start thinking in their own minds about what they're gonna need. 
We've got a couple of buildings that are already pretty active in that regard and they're willing and have been sharing with other principals. So I'm pretty confident that we're gonna be able to provide more SEL or social emotional learning than we have in the past because we need to. So uh, the, the beginnings of that conversation at the K-5 level have definitely taken place. Okay, thanks um, for that. Uh, Trustee McDonald has her hand up on the Zoom. Vicki, can you go? Uh, Trustee Vicki McDonald, do you have your hand up? Oh, there she is, okay. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. So I have, a, I have a couple questions and a comment. I kind of want to go back to the first part. I was kind of distracted when we were going over the first part, the first list. It's the list um, before the list that was called Keeping What Works. Um, did, did I hear you say that, that those, um, those uh, that was discussed in there is going to be paid through grants? So, uh, Trustee McDonald, I think the list you're referring to is a list I had on the screen called, uh, oh, let's see, Ongoing District Supports and Mitigation Strategies. Right, right. S some of that stuff um, doesn't require any additional support. Some of it does require additional staffing. So, Missoula Online Academy, that's our, that was the first item on that list. That obviously requires additional staffing. We're using, right. uh, we're using the ESSER funds, which is that federal grant that the district received to support okay. the online academy. The other one that requires some additional uh, monetary support, um, the staffing bullet talks about n extra nursing staff, um, the permanent subs, which I referred to earlier, those cost a little bit more than just a regular substitute teacher. And then the district coordinator, so the, the position that we established, the district COVID coordinator, all of that, ex that extra staffing would be paid for out of the ESSER funds. It would be one year only staffing, so just, just to get us through next year and then we'll have to decide after that wh where we go. Okay, okay, thanks. And then my second question was, is those um, related in um, keeping what works, is those extra, extra costs, if they are, where would the funds be, the funding be coming from? Yeah, same, same thing there. So um, it, keeping what works, I talked about the permanent subs. That's, that's definitely an added cost, um, which would come from the ESSER funds. The okay. other one that's there that um, we funded this year from our CARES Act and, and going forward, we'd, we'd fund from ESSER would be the, the art position. So we added art teachers at several schools. Um, if the board recalls going back a couple years in the budget, we actually added one additional art teacher. We had, I think, four or four and a half. We added an additional one. The CARES Act money allowed us to add a few more so that we could get um, more permanent art teachers at each building. Um, so that th those would be funded out of ESSER as well. Okay. All right. Great. And then my comment was is that I'm really excited about the, the change in the, the high schools. I, I think it's just refreshing and I'm excited that we're gonna do that and excited for the students. I think that's awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Trustee McDonald. I'm Trustee Oldperson. Um, I agree with Trustee Decker and Trustee McDonald. I'm really excited for what you presented tonight. But I, I agree with you that 750 is early for our middle school, and I don't think as a district we should limit ourselves to what an outside entity is putting us restrictions on us if we want to change that time. We should really see what works best for our students, even if it's something um, that is an outside entity. If Beach is limiting it, then we need to figure something out if we think a later start time for our middle schoolers is where we need to go. Did you have a response, Rob, or no? Well, yes. <laughs> um, yes, that's something we're looking at. I, I think, as I said before, um, having that third agency, that contractor that we, that we have with TransFinder, I think they're really gonna help us get to that point, but it is gonna take a little bit of time to get there, but I, I agree with you. I think um, just, just getting to what I presented tonight was, was quite a bit of effort and coordination, and I think um, as we go forward, it'll get even better. 
but yes, I agree with you. I, I, I think we've got the right people talking about the issue, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll come up with a better solution. Okay, Trustee of Garris. Thank you. Uh, actually, it's a good timing. I piggybacking what uh, Trustee Old Person said. Uh, Rob, I, I was curious about the start times, um, and I'm sure you've looked at this, and, but from my very lame in eyes, it would seem to me that middle school starting at 8.15 and elementary at 7.50 would solve a lot of problems for both. Is there a reason why we can't do that? Yes, I think I can explain this, but if I can't, Pat will help me explain it. So what's important uh, to know is that the high school routes are the longest routes because if you think about our high school district, it's very large and those buses have to go to the far reaches of the county. So. Um, it's important to have enough time between whatever goes before high school. Um, it's important to have enough time, at least 45 minutes, I think, between the, the routes that go right before high school. So the reason the elementary routes have to be right before the high school is because the elementary routes are the closest routes to the school. Because if you think about it, all the elementaries are in, sit in neighborhoods, right? So they can go to the neighborhood, pick up the kids, drop them off at the elementary schools, and then get to the high school routes. So if we moved the elementary routes, we'd also have to move the high school routes. And that, that created all kinds of problems. So that, that's the reason that elementary is in the middle. Trustee Mercer. So that would have been a question of mine too. It seems like flipping it, but, and then does it have to be the same for every school? Like I'm totally on board with getting the high schools on a unified schedule, but if, if we all think it would be best if middle school didn't start at 750, if it could work for one of them not to start at 550, why would they all sort of go down with the ship, I guess, sort of? Yeah, so, so um, what's interesting about our th three middle schools is they all feed into different high schools. If you look at CS Porter, for example, they send kids to all three high schools. So um, it would be difficult to change one school without affecting all of them. I think that's probably the basis of the reason. I think, um, there's other issues that we'd have starting them at different times. Um, after school activities is a good example. So once we get back into extracurricular activities, they, they'll be traveling to each other's schools to, to compete. And so having a common release time would be important. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just check with Paul. Can you see if Jen Vogel, if Trustee Vogel has her hand up? I can't tell. No, okay. Um, Grace, do you have another question? Thanks, and it actually tags on exactly what um, Trustee Mercer was just asking about whether all of three of the schools, um, well, whether all schools at any given band have to have the same schedule. Because I will speak to my son's experience at CS Porter. Um, he had to get on the bus at 725 for his schedule before. Um, and so it's really far from the north side to CS Porter. It takes a half an hour under normal circumstances. and those kids ride the bus for a real long time to get there, as long, longer than probably a lot of high school kids who live closer. Um, and so if Porter was able to have a bus plan that was unique, I think that would be really helpful for some of our highest needs, least likely to have help at home to get out the door. I would really, really worry about a lot of north side, west side kids getting on a bus at literally seven o'clock in the morning or earlier. Yeah, that's something we can definitely look into. I made a note of that. Okay. And I have a question, Rob. Um, will the high schools be allowed to have uh, sports practices before school and zero periods? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's one of the benefits of the high school schedule is, is zero periods. Um, that, those help with um, classes that you can't fit in the school day. So even though we have seven periods, you know, we've got a lot of singleton classes that are only offered once a day. So if you get into high school and you take a lot of those singletons, you end up running into conflicts. So zero periods will be available at all three high schools. Um, and then the practices are before school is something that happened this year um, because we didn't start till 10 o'clock. So th that's something that we will continue next year if possible to do some of those practices before school. Trustee Mercer, did you? Oh, Trustee Old Person? Um, 
Hearing you speak of extracurricular activities, the house bill that was just signed will, for the private schools and home schools, will those impact the budget at all? Um, our budget? My computer crashed, so I'm trying to restart it. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, trustee old person is referring to a house bill that was signed that allows um, homeschool students and private school kids, as long as the private school does not have activities, um, but it allows homeschool private school kids to participate in high school activities. Um, it would impact the budget, but there is a small uh, way to recoup some of that. So for every activity that they participate in, we can actually claim a 1 16th or a 1 8th A and B for that individual student. So we can get a little bit of it back. It won't probably cover the whole cost. Um, th I think the harder thing for us to figure out is um, making sure, especially if they're a homeschool student, making sure they still comply with um, like the academic requirements to participate in activities and the, um, all the items in the activities handbook, like the code of conduct that's in the activities handbook. They would have to comply with all of that stuff even though they're a homeschool student. So we're, we're still working through some of that. Okay, I, I'll have to say I don't think that's really on our agenda, so we can't take public comment on that. It, it's a peripheral to the current item. Thanks. Uh, do you have another question? Yep. Nope. I saw that um, the open door that the K-5 were liked, and I know I have kids at two different schools. There was no supervision at certain times, so would, how would that play into this next academic year? Yeah, that's something we're, we've been working with with our K-5 principals, like what that looks like. Um, 8.15, I think, is earlier than they started previously. Do you remember, Dave? Yeah, so we will have to, we'll have to focus on that supervision. The open door concept is really, um, is really a way to ins inspire kids to come in the building rather than stay outside, because if they're outside, the, you know, the supervision becomes more difficult. Trustee Mercer. Uh, <clears throat> one final comment and question. So just the art thing, I just wanna give my full support that there should be an art teacher in every elementary school, and I think we should make that happen. The ESSER money and the MOA and st stuff like that, is it sort of true that, so it's use it or lose it basically, and we have enough, right? We're not like, to have the MOA is not causing cuts anywhere else in anything we'd be doing. No, in fact, the, the MOA is gonna be greatly reduced from what it was this year. So I think uh, last count we had about 200 students, which we can support with fewer staff members in the MOA. So we, we believe we can support it next year with ESSER money without taking money away from anywhere else. Is there any more trustee questions or comments? Uh, trustee Alperson. Sorry, can you refresh um, my memory of who's all on the COVID task force committee? Yes, um, so Trustee Avgaris, uh, Trustee Decker, um, Trustee Wake are on the COVID task force. We also have um, principals from every level. We have teachers from every level. We have classified staff. Uh, we have um, staff from the MOA um, and we have parents from each level. We also have a a uh, member of the community at large who's a business person in town. No students? No, we don't have students. And I, I'm a member, trusty old person, you mentioned that to me once before and it's something we need to correct. So, so if that's all the trustee questions and comments, we will open this up to public comment. Um, Paul will manage the order of comment electronically. Um, again, please restrict yourself to three minutes. Um, only comment on items that are covered under this agenda item. And uh, you, you don't we want to name people's names or their specific positions. So uh, Paul, can you go ahead then? Sure, no public comments so far. I see hands. Gabriel, you want to go ahead and unmute your mic and speak? Sure. Thanks, everyone. I want to 
uh, echo some of the sentiments that trustees have already mentioned about appreciating all the thoughtfulness that you guys have put into returning to school next year. Um, I am thrilled also about the high school um, late later start time. I've heard great things about that this year and I have a high school student and I'm really um, looking forward to that schedule for him. I am also just going to reiterate some of the concerns of some of the trustees around the middle school start time. And again, specifically because I have a Lowell West Side kid who's going to CS Porter. And so um, as I think Trustee Decker mentioned, my kids have to catch a bus at 730 right now to get to their what 810 or 815 start time. So I'm just really concerned about that 7 a.m. potential um, bus pickup for kids on the north and west side. It's just really early and you're actually already talking about kids who are 13 and 14. So we're into the teen years and I um, am concerned about kids being able to catch that bus without maybe the support or kids who do their best and miss the bus and their families just don't have capacity to drive them to school at that time of day. So I appreciate any um, creative thinking we can have around different start times or different busing schedules or anything we can do to support um, in particular Porter because I my impression my understanding is that that school pulls kids from the farthest around town so we have some of the longest um, sort of bus commutes for kids thanks thank you um, who do we have next Anna you want to go ahead and spell your name and unmute yourself Yes, Anna Purrier, A-N-N-A-P-U-R-Y-E-A-R. -E um, I want to say thank you to everybody for all of their work on getting us back to school and back to normal. We're working really hard at school on making that all happen. But right now I'm speaking as a parent and um, I am sad that the sky has lost a, a period, but I am excited for per perhaps the academic um, intervention and support time. Um, I would hope that some of that is used to support our advanced learners in making other choices and extending their learning. Um, also that the intervention staff um, that will be used at the elementary level is available to um, ensure that our advanced learners are making at least a year's growth as we expect every learner to do in our school. Um, they they should get to make their year's growth, not just meet a benchmark. Thank you. Thank you. No one else has their hand raised. I see uh, Brenda Solorzano. Ms. Solorzano, there you are. Okay, if there's, now I do. Brenda, you wanna go ahead and unmute your mic and spell your name? Oh, her hand's gone down. I see Carrie Anderson. Do you wanna go ahead? Are we doing this right, Tracy? You, you don't see any hands. Do we? Just say. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Preer. Sorry, I just had one last um, question or thought for the zero periods at the high school. I know that's been really impactful this year. Will tra has transportation been thought about for those kiddos that would need to come in for their zero period? Um, because if it is a one-off class that's only offered at that time, they will need to be able to get to school. That was my only, my, that was my last note I forgot to say. Thank you. And seeing no one else, uh, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Oh, I'm good? Okay. Um, oops, lost my place. Okay, so the second item under new business is the 
to, to approve the Agricultural Center access easement. Um, Pat McHugh will present on that one. All right, thank you, Chair Lorenzen. Um, the uh, proposed easement is, begins on page uh, uh, 34. Um, the uh, intent of the easement is to help our egg center transport livestock via motorized transportation to land that the district owns um, between um, the land we own and the egg center is the uh, Fort Missoula Regional Park and the uh, um, and the Northern Rockage Heritage Center, so the, the fort. And so the, uh, the fort has already uh, agreed to our use of, uh, of, of a road that's on their property. And, and if you look on page 41, this exhibit A to the easement, um, I'm sorry, it's in black and white, but it describes both the uh, Missoula County easement and then the Northern Rockies use agreement. And uh, between the two, um, uh, negotiated use rights, our egg center will have the ability to transport animals to that property, um, uh, the district owned property for grazing purposes. So uh, this is a, um, a, a solution that uh, we appreciate the efforts of the city and the county and the Northern Rockies to, to help us make in, in safely transporting, transporting livestock. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Pat. Is there any board uh, questions for Pat or discussion? I think we've had this before. Um, seeing as there a motion from any trustee to uh, on this item, uh, Trustee Abgaris? Oh, do you do you move as per the agenda? Yep, move, so moved. Okay, Trust, the administration recommends trustees approve the attached easement agreement between MCPS and Missoula County. Is there a second? Second with Trustee Hobbins. Um, any board discussion on the motion? Vicki, your hands down. Okay. Uh, seeing none, all trustees in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand. Vogel is yes. Oh, oh, public comment. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Do we have any public comment on this motion? Um, seeing none, all trustees, please signify by raising your hand. And that's unanimous as to all trustees present. Um, next, we have the County Transportation Committee designee. Um, and again, Pat will present on that. Uh, thank you, Chair Lorenzen. So um, we have, uh, um, we're asking the, the Board of Trustees to uh, to designate or approve the designation of uh, Terry Phelan as our representative on the tr County Transportation Committee. And uh, the uh, committee uh, makeup was changed as a result of some legislation passed uh, this, this past year. And that legislation um, provided for more direction on who was on the committee and the, uh, who would vote as a representative of the committee. Um, Ann Wake and Terry have been on the committee and, um, and Ann Wake as a trustee has, has represented the, the school district on the committee. Um, the, uh, the recommendation for, for Terry um, to represent the district is based upon the fact that he supervises transportation and will be at the meeting in his role as the supervisor of transportation. Um, it, it's, it's, if the board chooses to uh, to designate the Ann Wake, that's certainly fine. Um, but but Terry will still be at the meeting. He'll just be. We just only have one representative who who's able to vote. And the most significant component of the change in talking to the county superintendent's office today is that previously the voting membership consisted of six members, and so a quorum was four. The membership will now include every district in the county, and there'll be 15 representatives, and a quorum will be eight. So they have some concerns about getting a quorum, um, but otherwise, uh, we get one representative, and uh, um, and uh, our transportation supervisor Terry Phelan will be at the meeting, regardless of whether he's 
designated by the board here tonight as our representative uh, or not. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Pat. Are there any board questions for Pat? Or Ann, did you want to say anything? <laughs> oh, yeah, I think you're muted. Um, Pat, I have a question. It, could trustees could trustees attend if they chose to without voting? I believe they could, yes. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Um, so uh, the recommendation is that the trustees approve Terry Phelan as the MCPS representative on the County Trust Transportation Committee. Is there a motion? Moved by Trustee Abgaris. Second? Oh, oh, thank you. Second by Vicki McDonald. Uh, is there any board discussion on the motion? I'm seeing none. All trustees in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Oh, oh, sorry, public comment. I'm gonna make a big note. Okay, is there any public comment on this agenda item? Um, okay, no public comment. Is there, a, all trustees in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand. And that's unanimous as to all trustees present. Um, the next agenda item is to approve transportation route mileage changes. Uh, again, Pat McHugh will present. All right, th thank you. And, and this is a routine item that we see each semester. Um, and uh, this is a um, little later in the semester, but what we uh, are compelled to do is, is to take a snapshot of our route mileage um, on a day during each semester and identify any changes in, in mileage. And so what's attached at page 43 is, is those routes with uh, mileage changes. And, and some uh, um, miles per route go up and some go down. And, and most of it has to do with, with ridership and, and who's being picked up and where for those various routes. Uh, so this is, uh, this is something that uh, is approved um, or goes before the County Transportation Committee for approval. And uh, I believe at this point has already been in front of the County Transportation Committee and talking with, with Terry. So um, we're looking for board approval of those, uh, those mileage changes that are attached. Thanks, Pat. Is there any, are there any board questions for Pat? Actually, I have a question. Is ridership based on the number that are eligible to ride or the number that actually ride? It's actual ridership, so it'll change um, based upon, upon who's riding. So we've sometimes will, some of these routes are special needs routes, other are uh, family and transition routes, so there can be some changes between one semester and the next. But it's ridership. Okay, thanks. Are there any other trustee questions or comments? Um, so the recommendation from the administration is that the trustees approve the bus route mileage changes for the second semester of the 2021 school year. Do we have a motion? Moved by Trustee Avgara, second by Trustee Decker. Um, is there any board discussion on the motion? Seeing none, is there any public comment? <laughs> Seeing none. All trustees in favor of the motion signify by raising your hand. And that's, that's unanimous as to all trustees present. Um, so our final uh, item under this category is the approve the beach transportation MOU memorandum of understanding. Again, Pat. All right, thank you. And, and the, the MOU is attached uh, beginning at page 44 and it, it, it this is for the second semester and, and really it, it mirrors the first semester and, and virtually every way, um, the, um, it, it, uh, we changed um, the uh, learning structure from first semester to second semester. We were in the hybrid learning model and then in, in the first semester and moved into phase two in the second semester. Um, the, the primary change is the, the Monday um, routes that were then run in the second semester that weren't run in the first semester. Um, the first semester, even though we were transporting half the students two days a week and the other half two other days during the week, we still hit every route. So we were still um, going to each route 
uh, to serve kids. So um, there's very little change between the, the two MOUs. Um, we're just trying to reflect the, um, the, the payment for the second semester since the first MOU ran through the end of the first semester. And it, this MOU, like the first, includes a credit for some of the uh, standby routes that we paid for um, to help support our uh, summer school program in June, uh, which, which Beach will do so, will be supporting us. Okay, thank you. Are there any trustee questions for Pat? So this, the recommendation from the administration is that the trustees approve the attached MOU with Beach Transportation. Um, is there a motion? Moved by Trustee Decker, second by Trustee Evgaris. <laughs> They're on. Is there any board discussion on the motion? Um, seeing none, is there any public comment? So no public comment. So all trustees in favor of the motion, please signify by raising their hand. And that is unanimous as to all trustees present. Um, our next ed education item under, or sorry, our next <laughs> agenda item under personnel negotiations and policy is to approve the early kindergarten learning program calendar for 2021. This will be elementary trustees only. Our full, yeah, so Dave Roth is presenting. Uh, good evening. Uh, approximately about a month ago, the trustees passed the uh, two different calendars for the uh, K-8 and then the high school calendars. Uh, this tonight, we're presenting four different calendars and focusing on the very first two um, is the early kindergarten learning program and the Jefferson preschool program. Um, what I would just point out is that they have different start dates than the other calendars and end approximately a week earlier. Um, but they mirror the same times for conferences and winter break and Thanksgiving break. Otherwise, they are uh, very similar. Thanks, Dave. We'll take, are there any questions on either of those two calendars on pages 47 and 48? We'll vote separately, but does anyone have any questions on these two? Trustee Decker? It's, it's kind of a tangential but related question. Um, the teachers in these programs, uh, the early kindergarten and the Jefferson preschool, how much professional development do they do together with K-12, like with K-5 teachers, and how much do they do as a unique group, would you say? I don't know that I can address that completely, and perhaps at least may be able to touch on that a little bit more, but we do include them in all of the district trainings that we do. And they have those days? Correct. Yeah, those days are all the same. Correct, and, they would, and, the and those teachers that would be hired would participate in our mentoring program and the other uh, programs that we have set up to support staff as well. So the, I guess I, what sort of sparked me to ask the question is that the rest of the teachers are all having four professional development days before the start of the school year, and these teachers don't. And, and this is the student calendar, but yes, they'll be participating in those, in those opportunities as well. Okay. It's a good question, thank you. Thank you. If, yeah, if I could just dovetail, um, I think two exciting things. One, that uh, all of our teachers in pre-K are part of our new faculty mentor program, so they're receiving the same supports to make sure that they have a successful year and reach that job satisfaction. Secondly, next year, I'm really excited that we are including our pre-K teachers into all of our ERLA training. Um, there's ERLA modules, especially for pre-K, that'll help us bridge pre-K into kinder. Um, the same goes for pre-K PLTW modules for science, so some hands-on science learning, um, and those teachers will be joining us in some training this summer. So it's a really exciting opportunity that we're finally able to get up and running. Um, thank you, Dr. Guest. Can you define your acronyms, please? <laughs> and, and lean, if you would, lean into the microphone a little bit. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> um, ERLA is Independent Reading Level Assessment. And PLTW is project, uh, lead the way, thank you. You put me on the spot there. <laughs> we get used to our acronyms. Thanks, is there any other board comments or questions? So we'll vote on these separately. Um, do we have a, a motion to approve the early kindergarten learning perm program 2021-2022 school year calendar? Moved by Trustee Hobbins, second by Trustee Oldperson. Is there any board discussion on the motion? 
Uh, Vicky, your hand. Vicky's down. Okay. Uh, seeing none, is there any public comment? Okay, all trustees in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand. And that's unanimous as to all trustees present. Uh, that now, if we would, I would take a motion to approve approve the Jefferson Preschool Program 2021-2022 school year calendar. Moved by Trustee Decker. Second by Trustee Oldperson. Um, is there any board discussion on the motion? Is there any public comment? Uh, seeing none, uh, all trustee, uh, trustees in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand. And that's unanimous as to all trustees present. Um, the next two agenda items are similar. They're to approve the CD Swan High School calendar and the Willard Alternative High School calendar. So we'll talk about those together, uh, Mr. Rott. Thank you. The Sealy Swan High School calendar does mirror the high school calendar uh, uh, fairly closely. I think the only change I would point out to the um, trustees is that the winter break is slightly shorter than the winter break for the high schools, and that was something that was collectively decided by the staff and approved by the union. Otherwise, it would mirror very closely in uh, following the high school schedule that was already previously adopted. And how about Willard? Um, the Willard calendar is almost identical to the prior one. The difference that you would find is that Willard runs a block schedule, um, and so what you would note on the calendar is that there are different designations for their blocks versus quarters and semesters. Okay, do we, anyone have any questions for Mr. Rott? Okay, we accept a motion to approve the CD Swan High School 2021-2022 school year calendar. Moved by Trustee Wake. Second by Trustee of Garris. Is there any board discussion on the motion? Um, seeing none, is there any public comment? All trustees in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand. And that's unanimous as to all trustees present. Um, so we accept a motion to approve the Willard Alternative High School 2021-2022 school year calendar. Moved by Trustee Oldperson, second by Trustee Abgaris. Is there any board discussion on the motion? Is there any public comment? So all trustees in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand. And that is unanimous as to all trustees present. Um, now we go into teaching and learning. Uh, the first topic is to approve early admission to kindergarten, uh, presented by Russ Lodge. Good evening, everybody. We have uh, two students, two kindergarten students who are, you can see in the packet, their birthday just missed the September 10th cutoff date. So those parents made application to the district um, and their kids were tested by Shirley Lindbergh, our um, gifted ed coordinator and our ELL, English language learner coordinator. They go through a couple of one-hour sessions. She evaluates them in five or six different areas. Then uh, that is shared with the principal and then the principal makes the final recommendation. So these two children are just gonna turn five a few days after the September 10th deadline, but according to Shirley and then in conversation with the parent, with the principal, they are uh, ready to be a kindergartner. So the recommendation coming forward tonight is that we approve these two little kids and they can start kindergarten in the fall. Thank you, Mr. Lodge. Are there any questions or board discussion? So seeing none, I would accept a recommendation or an, a motion f to approve the age waiver for the two students identified. Moved by Trustee Hobbins, second by Trustee of Garris. Is there any board discussion on the motion? And this actually is an elementary item, so this will be voted on by the elementary trustees. So all elementary trustees who support this motion, please signify by raising your hand. And that's unanimous as to all trustees present. Um, the next topic is to approve an out of country travel request, again with Mr. Lodge. So Hellgate High School would like to travel, not this summer, but the following summer to Australia with their high school band 
to participate in a festival there. So you got quite a bit of information in your packet about uh, all the details, the cost, the chaperones, the uh, itinerary itself. Um, it's pretty detailed. I know that um, Leon Slater, the director of bands, is on the Zoom tonight, as well as um, Monty Grise, our fine arts coordinator, if you've got any questions. So we're just presenting this tonight for your approval. If we travel out of country, we have to have the board approval. If we travel across a different state line, then it's a central office kind of approval. So this is for your decision making tonight. And Hellgate High School would like to take their bands to uh, Sydney, Australia in July of 22. Thank you, Mr. Lodge. Is there any input from the two Hellgate uh, employees identified? Is there any board questions or discussion? Uh, Trustee Decker? I mean, it at this point probably goes without saying, but anything that would be going on related to the pandemic would, of course, supersede any decision about approval that we would make tonight. So that, this sounds like such a fantastic opportunity, right? And just it's so exciting to think about kids getting to have these opportunities again um just recognizing that we you know we all make plans and yeah so just making sure i don't know it doesn't say that in there anywhere and i just want to make sure that if we are approving it that that's maybe just a given or you could put that in the motion when when the time comes and any other board comments or questions I have a couple questions, and um, I, I mean, I, I've already asked you this, but will students who have already graduated from MCPS be allowed on the trip, and, and how will their behavior be supervised? Uh, they've requested to, to take kids um, who have already graduated, but only as participants. So they're, if uh, they're not going as chaperones, they're not going to watch, they're going to play. Uh, so they're going to be treated in the same fashion as the kids who are still in high school, so to speak. Uh, we did ask that specific question ourselves at our meetings. There's not a lot. There's a few. and uh, But they've requested to have those kids considered as well. Okay. Thanks. And my other question, based on what Trustee Decker mentioned, if this, this were to get canceled on account of COVID or any other reason, what will happen to the funds that are raised? So Monty, I hope you're on the call <laughs> to help me out. We've had that discussion as well. I know Monty's got more details as well as Leon. So if either one of you could uh, help out with that question, it's appreciated. Yeah, Leon, I think you should, you probably be better to solve that. Yeah. Um, so the, the funds that we're tracking for this project would fall into two, two different categories. One would be a family contributing on behalf of their student to go on the trip. Um, that money would be handled in accordance with um, the trip cancellation policies that are stated in the contracts that we would sign. Um, and ha they have specific dates resulting in uh, various percentages of refund that those individual monies that are, are uh, given by a family on behalf of their student would be of course, uh, return to the family based on um, the, those percentages. The other money that is fundraised uh, would be retained in the school. Um, we would get the same uh, percentage of um, refund uh, from the company, and but that money would stay within the school and be used for future band travel or future um, scholarship opportunities for other students. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Slater, uh, Trustee Abgaris? Actually, uh, a question for Rob. Um, uh, piggybacking on what, what Grace asked, how are, because this is probably not this is the first, but not the last that will come before us, I'm assuming. How are these handled? Are they handled like extracurricular activity, where if a decision's made for extracurricular activities, it affects these sort of trips, or is it, how is that handled within the school? Yeah, so actually I, I breezed over it in the COVID reopening plan, but we actually referenced travel in the COVID reopening plan. And 
there are two guidelines we have right now from CDC, one for domestic travel and one for international travel. And those seem to change frequently. And so we're gonna have to watch those really carefully over the next year, not only for this trip, but any trip that gets approved. Um, and so what we've been doing as people have, as Superintendent, Assistant Superintendent Lodge mentioned, this one is coming to the board because it's out of country, but we have had other requests for in-country trips that follow the same procedure, they fill out the same paperwork. And we've been telling all of those folks that are planning this that uh, we're gonna have to base the final decision on the CDC guidelines. So for example, if you look at the latest CDC guidelines for international travel, it says that um, once you get back, you'd have to quarantine, um, especially if you're not vaccinated. So those are some of the things we would have to put into the mix and let people know if they're taking these trips not only for student trips, but also for staff that might be traveling for professional development. Are there any other questions for Mr. Slater or Trustee Decker? Um, my question is about the graduates and I can only imagine how disappointing it must be for the students who auditioned and were accepted and their trip to have been this summer isn't happening, right? And so I understand the desire to have those kids included next year if at all possible but i'm curious about numbers of kids who would be able to go and whether there might be you know a full band roster of kids and how you'll pick and choose if you end up needing to pick and choose who might be able to go and also related at what date people would need to make a commitment to the trip because once students leave high school life has a way of kind of getting them on a fast uh, fast-paced ride that that you know, a high school trip may not feel in a year as acute as it does now. So I'm just wondering how we're planning for all that. You bet. And when we started this, uh, the thought process on this um, was back in October. Um, we extended the invitation of those students or we're, we're attempting to include those students um, just because we were supposed to do a, a trip this year uh, with those kids. So. Some of them have been fundraising for a couple of years um, and have, have a bit of a nest egg already uh, saved up through fundraising efforts. Um, so um, I have not heard back from all of the seniors. Our deadline is actually tomorrow for feedback on the trip um, to see exactly how many of them will be going. Um, I have 18 seniors this year, or really 20, but 18 that would be potentially going on the trip. And um, out of those 18, I've heard from, from 10 of them uh, that will not be going on the trip. Um, so I think it's gonna be a fairly low number of 20, 21 graduates that would go on this trip. Um, you notice the dates of this trip are, are June, end of June, beginning of July in 2022. So this would include graduates of MCPS um, next June, those seniors for next year will have graduated. Um, so that's why we also wanted to point that out and make sure that it was included in the, in the proposal. So I guess the, the short of it is 2021 graduates, I'm expecting very few. 2022 graduates, probably quite a few. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions or discussion? So I would entertain a motion, um, Grace, if you want to state it in case you want to add a caveat. I would move that we approve this exciting request for travel in 2022 pursuant to whatever the um, current MCPS guidance regarding um, travel and COVID precautions is at that time. Thank you. Is there a second? Second by Trustee Oldperson. Is there any board discussion on the motion? Is there any public comment? Seeing none. All trustees in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand. And that is unanimous as to all trustees present. And then our final topic under teaching and learning is uh, International Baccalaureate Review Part 1. And that again will be Russ Lodge, Assistant Superintendent. Yeah, good evening again. It's my third in a row here. So. 
It's nice to be able to uh, present this, uh, present, give this presentation to you tonight. Sitting next to me is Dr. Elise Guest, and our third player on our team this year has been Hatton Littman, our communications director. Uh, she, she's not, uh, she's out of town right now. So, so Elise and I are going to present to you tonight the information that we have uh, accumulated since uh, last November. And it's been a pretty uh, exhaustive process. Um, we have looked at a variety of different areas. Um, it's basically an audit of the IB program. And um, we've, we've looked at finances, we've, lo we've interviewed staff, we've talked to principals and students and parents. And at the same time, we tried to develop a template that we're using so that we can use it again. Because there's other initiatives in the district that we're gonna try and look at down the road to see if they've been doing what originally we hoped they had been doing, see if they met their goals. The one caveat tonight is that uh, made a mistake in the beginning that we're, we did not include Franklin Elementary, and we should have. So that was a mistake I want to acknowledge. We've got a program at Big Sky, we've got a program at Cent, uh, Hellgate, uh, Washington, Lewis and Clark, but we should have included Franklin. We included them from the beginning in the, in the financial picture, but in hindsight, uh, I wish we would have talked and gone through the same process with the Franklin parents, staff, and I've met with the PTA at Franklin and met with the staff and apologized to them that we didn't do that. But I do want you to know going forward, Franklin's very much part of the discussion. They're no more out than anybody else. They're, they're part of this thing. And so there's also a lot of information here tonight. And I think it's gonna take a little while to process. I think that's why uh, we mentioned this might be part one. So it might take a couple of meetings. This is an informational only meeting or agenda meeting tonight. And so um, with that, I think we're gonna get started. Um, we had three main questions and you see them on the screen that we wanted to take a look at. Did, did MCPS meet the goals of the previous strategic plan? Achievement for all. So you're on a new strategic plan right now, that, uh, but this, this initiative was under the old one. So we, that's part of our first bullet. Second is the specific initiative accessible to all MCPS students, another general all, uh, overall guiding question for us. And finally, do all MCPS students have the opportunity to participate in this specific initiative? So that's just kind of the setup, uh, and I'm moving along quickly because we've got a lot of information to present to you. Um, but with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Elise. She's gonna begin the conversation with this next slide that you see now about how we went about gathering this information and the process we used. Elise? So we're really excited to share this process with you. Oh, my apologies. We're really excited to share this process with you and the process is really grounded in research and evidence-based practices that start with this kind of framework of thinking. And if you think with an IB lens on, it was 10 years ago under the Achievement for All where you know, um, community members and leaders across MCPS and the community came together and said, should we even do this? IB sounds interesting, we need to learn more. And they embarked on a journey that started at this red zone, which we call an exploration zone, where they just wanted to explore, what is IB? Is it a good fit for our community? Does this work with our Achievement for All plan? Is it part of our vision? And so that led us to either through grassroots levels of teams in buildings or through more direction from administration to ask teachers to go and explore this, to learn more about IB and bring it back to our communities. Those teams of teachers then led the school communities through a process that began an initial implementation where data systems were set up, curriculum was established, um, a chance for teams to come together and talk about the learnings of IB in an inquiry-based model of teaching was established. And from there, in years to come, that kind of initial implementation became more solidified and, um, and really became part of the school's culture. And so with that, we find ourselves at this 
kind of end of that journey with an opportunity for us to really look at our system to establish like what is working is it still meeting the needs of our community is that fit still there where we found some great successes where we found some challenges and really take a moment to do some deep reflective learning about our systems and our processes and and then thus make some decisions together in that shared um, manner and so this is a nice visual that we've really really leaned on through this process to remind us of where we started and really appreciate that initial kind of exploration and embarking that happened during Achievement for All that's led us to where we are today. And ultimately, when we think about how we tried to review IB, it was with the essence of that trying to create a template of a process that we could use with multiple initiatives, that we can be really thoughtful about what is working for us now and the community we have, the students that are in our classes now, our teachers, and what works best for our vision based on the strategic plan we are establishing together. So we came to you in November with this is our process and now we come to you with a lot of data and learnings that have taken place in the last couple months and it's exciting to share that with you and exciting to honor just the amount of time and commitment that has been put into really looking at an initiative at this level in depth. So we shared with you that there's four kind of main data points that really guide this work. And one is just local data. As, as Russ said, we looked at a lot of financials that we'll get into later. We looked at um, student and staff outcomes and how the impact of, of IB and how it has influenced our teaching, how it's influenced our learning has really impacted um, our community. We also conducted empathy interviews and surveys and focus groups that's under that essence of user voice. We really want to hear that um, individual perspective and experience that really helps guide a lot of these decisions. And then lastly, we created a task force that you'll hear about in a little bit um, where people from across our MCPS community came together to really look at this data and have some really rich, um, difficult conversations around some suggestions and insights for the future of IB. Uh, we also spent time talking to our partners at University of Montana, the National IB, um, IB Organization, Washington Foundation, to make sure that the decisions that we make moving forward are in line with, uh, with our partners um, at that scholarly level. So in thinking about this, the first thing that Russ and I embarked upon is empathy interviews. And what you can see is we, um, we just sent out an email to everyone saying, we would love to hear from you. We have two questions. We want to hear what has supported the implementation of IB and what has been an inhibitor, what, is, what has kept you from, from feeling like you're implementing IB successfully. And it was really exciting to get this resounding response that people really wanted to be heard and to share their story. And we heard from everyone. We heard from counseling staff to um, CTE to content area specialists to administrators. We heard from a wide variety of our staff members. And it was really exciting to spend 30 minutes with uninterrupted time with our staff to hear from them and to hear what's worked and what hasn't worked. And it's really led us to a lot of great insights. What you can see in total is there's 56 interviews. What you don't see is that also led to additional interviews with people who are like, oh, I want to get in on this too and I, I have so thoughts I want to share. And so it really allowed Russ and I to have a very busy schedule but time where we are really dedicated to hearing from people across our community. The second kind of user voice was in our student and parent focus groups. And these were really exciting. They happened in the evening. And you can see that between the student groups at Lewis and Clark, Washington Middle and Big Sky, we had um, a few of our students participate. Um, and then you can also see our parents who were able to participate in our evening sessions as well. As well. The questions that we really tried to focus in on during these focus groups was a lot about experience. Tell us about your experience with IB. What has worked? What has helped you to reach your academic goals? What has, what has been challenging? What has kept you from not reaching those goals? And just asking those few questions really led to um, a wide variety of twists and turns in a conversation that was really rich and it was great to have those opportunities. I think some of our highlights were going into the schools and hearing from our students and hearing about their experience and how they use their own vernacular to 
explain their participation in IB, and that was very insightful. There was certainly some trends that we saw across the empathy interviews and the focus groups, and they, they were brought into these um, five themes that really helped us to hone in on what we were hearing and what was very similar. I think what was insightful for both Russ and I is that through each of these conversations and these focus groups, these themes were resoundingly strong and consistent across, um, across these conversations. And that's really, I think, exciting and confirming that our experience with IB is very similar and shared. And there's many things that we can learn from each other on what's worked and, and where we need to respond now as a community with the future of IB at MCPS. And Russ is gonna talk a little bit more about these five themes. So the IB pedagogy, you know, we talked to a lot of people. We, we received nothing but positive feedback on the pedagogy of IB, whether we were at Lewis and Clark um, or the high schools, um, it was across the board. People really liked the style that, that the IB presents and we didn't get anything but positive feedback from everybody. Uh, equity and access was a little bit mixed at the high school level. The equity piece was um, made clear to us because kids can request between the eighth and ninth grade year to go to a different high school. And we try and honor as many of those as we can. Um, then at the elementary, of course, we've got nine elementary schools. So some of the equity questions did come up at times, uh, being at uh, one school instead of uh, the rest, or in Franklin's case, maybe under consideration or on pause. But, um, but then of course equity with, if you have it at your school, you've got equity within the building. So the, the, the definition of equity changed a little bit, but we kind of heard both sides of that throughout those interviews. As far as the teaching community, um, people just wanted more. The teachers we talked to really liked IB, they really liked the pedagogy behind it, but they talked to us about having the ability to um, have more time to plan, uh, put their own stamp on things because the, the framework in IB allows them to work within a framework, yet they can do a little bit of their own thing. They love the IB profile. Um, they wish they could do more vertical teaming with, grade, with uh, other teachers in other departments or other grade levels. Um, a little bit mixed back and forth, but overall pretty positive. The resource allocation, of course, people um, wanted more training. We always had the need for more training. We heard that across the board. Curriculum was an issue as well because of simply finances at times. And uh, at times people had exactly what they needed in the elementary world. You don't need a lot of curriculum because it's integrated into the existing um, subject areas. But at high school, as both high schools expanded their programs and both, both high schools did expand their programs over the last few years, uh, curriculum became an issue in certain spots because curriculum can be expensive. Um, and then the final one is what, at least the uh, parent student experience. Again, uh, positives across the board we did hear about the stress level at the high school, especially with kids doing the diploma program uh, and the importance of communication, the importance of communication with the uh, IB coordinators and people on staff to help kids navigate, you know, some really difficult, basically college coursework, you know, when you're 16, 17, 18 years old. So that was basically, again, we're going quickly because there's a lot to process here, but. Overall, I think that was the themes behind our um, focus groups and our empathy interviews. So taking all of this data, it was really important for us to bring a task force of staff members together to dig into the information further and to use um, what we call a hexagon tool. This tool is part of evidence-based practices around improvement science. We often use this in our new faculty program. Um, when we want to really look and evaluate, is IB still a good feasible option for MCPS? Is it still a good fit? Um, does it really allow us to further move our organization? And so here in the hexagon tool, just to orient you, and then we're going to unpack each of the six indicators. But there's six indicators, and they're broken down into 
two main themes. One is around just whether or not the program, in this case IB, is a good fit for us. And then the second is the implementing site. Can it be done in our schools? So it's an opportunity to use a tool that has a set of guiding questions and a rating scale where our task force members were able to really dig into the information, share in some really difficult conversation, come to consensus, and then identify whether or not IB could meet the, need, could meet the requirements um, based on this tool. And we'll talk a little bit further about this, and I'm happy to answer questions as we go, but I think this was a pivotal um, tool to use in the process to really allow us to dig deeply into um, the thought process around IB and really gaining some further insights. I, before moving forward, really want to acknowledge our task force members. We, we asked them in a difficult year, um, right before IB exams were being given, to come um, meet in this room and come together to do this work. And I know some of them are on, um, on the meeting Zoom tonight and I really wanna acknowledge their time and contributions. What you can see with this task force is we, again, sent out an email to all schools and said, would you be willing to participate? If so, fill out a Google form. Every single member on the task force filled out a Google form, so we accepted everybody that said they wanted to join in. And what was exciting is they had to answer a couple questions about why and their interest and what they can bring to advance the conversation. And those, those answers allowed us to create quickly a really strong collaborative trusting team who shared in difficult dialogue and were able to get through this work in a day and a half. And so I really commend them for, for what they were able to do and what they, they opted into doing. Um, so each, each member had to take on one of these indicators and they first had to, as a team, talk about that first question that Russ spoke about. Did we meet the goals of the first achievement for all plan? I'm sorry, I just saw you. Is this a good time to answer any questions? Go ahead. Okay. No, oh, sorry, you just said if we had questions we can ask. Can I ask a question? If okay. it works for you, yeah. For, for your task force members, I don't see any community, I don't see parents, and I don't see students. Is that, in, was that the intent? Yes, and, and thank you for bringing that up because I, I would love to make sure to clarify that. We tried to get a wide variety of stakeholders in different ways, like the students and the parents in those focus groups. Um, and then the empathy interviews for people who, who didn't want to join in a team part but wanted to have an individual conversation. And then this was another opportunity for people from all of the schools, some who were IB teachers, some were not, um, some had different connections to IB to come and join in on um, a more focused, uh, concentrated group of looking at the, the, the data. Um, we wanted to make sure that this group was able to look at the data um, and really like suss out some insights that would help further our conversation. But we wanna make sure that in, in thinking about this review that this is one portion of the multiple levels of data that were included. So trying to be as holistic as possible. And I think, um, and maybe this isn't the right moment, but I think there's a lot that we can reflect on and think, oh, did this work? Or do we need to shift some things for future reviews? Um, and I'm really looking forward to that kind of reflective dialogue at the end of all of this. Does that help answer the question? Yes, and then um, out of the task force members, are any of them identify as BIPOC? Uh, you know, I don't think we know that. Um, we basically sent it out to people that we had interviewed. So whether they, some are in that uh, specific category, I don't know. They could be, and but I, will, I really don't know. I, I will say um, you'll see in some statements later that there, there's certainly um, a nod to making sure that this work had a lens of equity considerations, that there was an essence of making sure that how they were speaking advanced that notion of equity and access, which were those second questions. I know um, that was something that was definitely important to this task force. And can we define BIPOC, please? Black Indigenous Person of Color. Thank you.
Thank you. So thinking about this task force, they first answer the question of, yes, we did engage our students um, and increase their engagement through the implementation of IB. And yes, in looking at the data, they said they came to the consensus that we did engage our students with those 21st century skills, such as communication and, and so on. And so that allowed us to answer that first question and then allowed us to go deeper in answering the second questions around access and um, opportunity. And so how we did this is you can see that we went through each indicator and the task force was broken into groups based on their level of interest in a specific indicator. And together in groups of two or three, they work to, um, to really dig into each of these indicators. Each indicator has five to seven questions that helps guide the discussion for the smaller group. And then they're asked to give a rating on a scale of one to five, five meaning strongly agreeable that this is, is strong and working. So the first indicator is need. And when you look at need, this one is specific to site. It's asking, do our sites, do our schools need something like IB to further advance our um, academic offerings and uh, embrace the pedagogy and so forth? And so this group came to a consensus around one statement that says, IB schools demonstrate an understanding of how IB meets the needs of their school community. However, currently, IB programs are not accessible to all. And so with that statement, they said, it is a four out of a five, but recognizing that strong um, second statement of however, this needs to be addressed. So this was a level of insight around the notion of need. We have a need at our sites, but we recognize it's not accessible at all sites. Um, you can see under that need, there's an identification of a focused population that our kids do um, a, respond well to IB, that there's multiple data sources that say that our kids are accessing IB. Um, there's a community perception that IB is, is something that's strong uh, for our schools. However, it's not accessible to all and hence it got a four out of five. The next one is evidence. And this one is really strong because it's about the research. Does the research tell us that IB in this case is a strong program to be implementing. Is there research behind it that says that it's good for our kids? And so when you think about evidence, um, it's really examining whether or not it, it has strong research saying it's important for our kids. And so this group said, again, with a rating of four out of five, the program has demonstrated effectiveness in developing 21st century skills embedded within our IB pedagogy, our approaches to learning, our IB learner profile, and IB curriculum or units of inquiry. All of those elements are strong, major kind of foundational components to the IB programming. The program has demonstrated increasing student engagement. Qualitative and quantitative data available to the task force supports these conclusions. All indicators of evidence pointed to level five. However, we're not, be, we're not able to review disaggregated data relative to diverse populations. And we've heard this from our iValue team and in looking at some of our data that we need to bolster our data systems to enable us to uh, review some more disaggregated data and they recognized that this was a piece missing out of this review. The next um, indicator is fit and fit is around whether or not it fits into our school, whether or not there is that enabling context, whether or not it relates to our community values and whether or not it it is um, symbiotic with existing initiatives. Like does it work in connection with all, that, all the other pieces that are happening in our community? And so here around FIT, um, IB is embedded in our district and aligns culturally and philosophically with our community. And we certainly heard that in the empathy interviews. IB is an inquiry-based pedagog pedagogical approach that naturally intersects with our other district initiatives. Um, they gave it a 4.6 out of five, and I will say that is my typo. It's supposed to be a four. I was corrected on that today on an email from one of the members of, um, of this um, subgroup. Thank you. The next one is usability. And usability goes back to the program. Like, are we able to operationally embed it in our current systems? Are we able to clearly 
collect data, to look at all the features of IB and implement it with um, fidelity and implement it with a high level of accountability. And so here around usability, again, um, the, the subgroup gave it a four out of five saying, IB is embedded in our district. Oh my gosh, is that the, did I just, that is, I'm sorry, that is the same statement. I, the statements are all at the end and I'll read that to you next. My apologies. The next one is capacity, and capacity is around site. Like, do we have the capacity in order to uh, really implement this well? Do we have the finances for this? Do we have the time in our schedule? Do we have the opportunity for personnel to get the training they need? And in here, again, four out of five, um, it says overall IB program is well-defined and allows adaptations for context in our populations. And that speaks specifically to how our teachers talked about how they could differentiate the curriculum, how it could meet the needs of our students, and how it does fit within um, our context. Um, and last in the indicators is supports. And supports is specifically around resources. Um, supports is around can we truly implement IB to the extent and quality that is required, whether it's because of the staffing um, and whether it is because some of the requirements around professional learning and so forth. And so here the subcommittee gave it the lowest rating out of all the, the six indicators saying ongoing funding is necessary in order to sustain professional development, the programming, new staff orientation, annual fees and materials. With the sunset of our startup grant from SHAPE, or what is known now as the 21st Century Teach and Learning Grant, we're unsure of where the funding will come from. Leading part of those insights around what will be the funding sources that help guide this um, if we choose to further um, implement in the future. So we share each of these indicators because I think each of them offers some really insightful, specific um, insights that the subgroups were able to, to share. And in one slide after the next, we'll have all of the statements together and I'll show you the one that I um, misstepped on and we'll make that right. So with that, the last portion of data was around the financial data and Russ is gonna talk about that. So um, each of you have in your packet tonight about seven pages of data and the front page is the um, all schools combined. Again, this is a lot to take a look at, but basically here's seven years of data about IB. And the top line, SHAPE 21st Century Grant, is the grant that we've been working with and have been afforded to work with um, training and professional development. And you can see the amount of money that's been spent out of the grant over the years, the totals in the right-hand column. Then in the next line, you see the general fund. That's, this is the actual staffing, usually, that comes out of uh, the general fund for, for all the schools each year over seven years. Again, in the right-hand column, uh, the total. A little bit of donations over the years. Um, student paid testing fees. Students have to pay money to take the tests. And so that's, uh, that is a line item that's in there. And then the other. So that's our revenue. Then if you look down below, you see it broken down into elementary and broken down into secondary. You can pretty much uh, take a look that staffing is coming out of the general fund and professional development and training and fees coming out of the grant. So you kind of got to stare at that a little bit. So that first page is all, all the schools seven years, the last, um, so you can see um, combined total in the bottom right-hand column of 2.7 million, of which um, 741,000 is out of grant money and about one, a little more than 1,700,000 uh, out of um, general fund dollars. So that's kind of the front page. The other pages then break it down by school follows the same format. You can glance back and look at Lewis and Clark, Franklin, Washington, Hellgate, and Big Sky and see where the money's been spent um, over the last seven years. And Trustee Mercer, I see, might have a question. Go ahead, Trustee Mercer. Could you define what staffing means in this context? I mean, are these 
teachers that are out would otherwise be funded just as a normal teacher? Right, so if you've got an IB program at your school, you're gonna have an IB coordinator. So that's a half-time position. You're also gonna have a Spanish teacher. That's a full-time position. So generally that's the staffing. At the high school level, you might also have a CAS coordinator, which that person um, coordinates activities, kind of a volunteerism kind of thing with IB outside the school or programs that you watch. Um, so that's the, that's the three main things that are probably in the staffing world. I think I'm getting it all out, Elise. And if I can add, there's been times where um, we've had a staff member teach a course outside of the contract time. So um, an IB music theory course that's taught after school or during a zero period, that staff member would be paid that additional section um, so that we could offer that one section for those students. Thank you. Are there any, were you done, Russ? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, then I think we'll open it up to trustee questions and comments. Go ahead, Grace, I see your hand. <laughs> Thanks. Um, this is super timely with the review of our strategic plan underway and sort of looking at where we go from here. Um, this was obviously a lot of work and effort and organization and thank you for that. Um, I want to like t take a little walk back through history for a second <laughs> because IB was part of um, an effort to bring our schools into the 21st century that took place under Superintendent Apostle. And part of that Achievement for All plan, it was the graphic that was on the wall forever, was about engaging all students. A lot of the um, sort of innovative flagshipy programs that have come into the district over the past years, including the Health Science Academy um, including dual language at Paxson and including IB were all kind of launched under this effort to engage students differently in um, authentic 21st century learning. Another piece of that Achievement for All plan was around facilities. It was the 21st century learning environments. Hello, Bond. And in some ways, the projects that were about student engagement that got launched before the Bond <laughs> can be sort of distinguished from some of the projects about student engagement that got launched after the bond. And I think reviewing IB and the history in the district speaks directly to the equity piece in a very stark way. So I'm glad that that came up in the discussions. I'm glad Trustee Old Person raised an important question already about that. And I'm glad we're having this conversation now as we're thinking about our strategic plan. Sorry, this really is gonna be a question. My question is, <laughs> <laughs> My question um, has to do with the fact that we really can't evaluate, I don't think, the IB program without comparing it to our other schools. Um, without comparative data about student achievement, what is the value, in fact, of evaluating student achievement in IB? Without asking parents in non-IB schools about their experiences, do they like the pedagogy in their schools? Do they like what they're experiencing? Do they feel like their students are engaged? How are we making a decision and how are we actually reviewing the impact of IB if it's all internal to itself? Um, so my question is, I think that, that the um, piece on here about student data that is, that is not able to be disaggregated for specific populations is speaking to this, but can we, can we learn about student achievement data and control for income or control for race? or compare to non-IB schools when we look at expenses, or compare to non-IB schools when we look at um, qualitative experiences. Um, because in, in reviewing IB and whether it meets our goals as a district, I think we can't do that in a vacuum without saying what's been the impact of IB on our ability to provide for an equitable um, experience across the district at the same time. We really can't do this in isolation. So my question is, is that data that was out of the scope of this analysis for now? Um, or is it data that we have and just haven't kind of brought to bear yet, I guess? I, I would say that, yeah, it wasn't part of this scope. It wasn't part of the work. Um, but it's not something that we can't tackle. It's not something we can't put together. We just need time. And, and we'd, we'd probably need a whole nother year because it's hard to put that data together and do it in a thoughtful way learn from the mistakes we've made here, and uh, come back with a product that looks at a more 
global picture, but it would really be helpful if the board would give us some direction there too, just like you have in your explanation. So we, we knew exactly what you wanted us to look for um, because that, that's important. Now, you know, I gotta just give you the, at the high school level, IB is thriving at Hellgate and Big Sky, doing really well. Um, so I, I want, want to get that out in the public forum because I want those parents to know that uh, there's a diploma there and, uh, and you know, we're not looking at uh, not having IB here in the near future. And I speak from a central office position, not a board position. I acknowledge that, but I just want to be able to say that. Um, but then looking across all schools, um, we, we would need more time to really put it together, to be thoughtful, to share the collaboration um, and, and really get what the board is exactly asking us to look for would be really helpful. And thank you, Russ, and I think tonight's discussion we'll try to take good notes and, and try to, to communicate that to, to Rob. Uh, Trustee Oldperson? Um, when you discussed the group themes, you talk, one of them was equity and access, and you said a definition change. Can you elaborate on that and give me some examples? Yeah, you know, the, the equity piece came up a lot, uh, some kind of pros and some kind of cons. So the, the we had people you know, talk about that we've only got IB at one elementary school, one was on pause, and the other elementary schools didn't have any IB. So the equity was a question because you could get an IB education at an elementary school, but you had to live in that neighborhood. So th that's where equity came in. But then if you looked at equity from inside the school, especially Lewis and Clark, where you have 400 kids, everybody is getting an IB uh, philosophy, profile, pedagogy. So then that equity, then, then you had everybody covered. Uh, at the high school level, the equity piece seemed a little bit easier to solve because kids have the ability to move between their eighth and ninth grade level and request a high school that has an IB program. So they do have more access. Uh, although, just for your knowledge, uh, IB is a junior and senior course. You, you, don't, you don't take IB courses at the freshman and sophomore level. So again, a little bit of equity inside a high school. It's, a, it's an advanced programming uh, placement class <laughs> uh, for juniors and seniors. But then what do you do for freshmen and sophomores so that they can be ready for the junior senior level? And some of our principals are adding some AP courses to look at rigor at the freshman and sophomore level to try and get a prep for junior and senior level. So the word equity kind of floated into different areas depending on a little bit of uh, the people we talk to and their perspective. So I hope that answers your question. If, can I add Did, to that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, something to dovetail off of what Russ said is, especially in the high school level, we looked at when thinking about engagement how many students in the junior and senior class since the inception of IB have been taking one or more IB courses? And that was really interesting to watch how the percentages increased up to at Big Sky now there's 80% of a junior or senior class taking at least one IB course. So it's exciting to think about how in answering that second question around accessibility and opportunity, they're providing opportunities. So for example, at Big Sky, They've, they've managed to change their English department so that English 11 and 12 is all IB. Everyone is taking an English IB course in 11th and 12th grade, every single junior and senior. Um, and so those are exciting shifts that each department is making as they um, learn how to, to make this work and how to make it more accessible. I think also we heard from specific teachers from Hellgate talking about how IB's pedagogy and approaches to learning offer a wide variety of ways to differentiate for students' learning needs. So they often have um, students on IEPs and 504 plans and a wide variety of other learning needs that are met in those courses through that differentiation and ability to, to take the, the curriculum and really individualize it for that student's experience. Um, we certainly heard that in um, talking to the one student at Big Sky as well. So there was that piece that was definitely part of that theme. And, and just to give you a little more background knowledge, Big Sky High School would like to be all IB. That's kind of where they're headed, if they can get there. 
in all departments at the junior senior level. Now, they're not there yet, but that's where they'd like to go. Hellgate High School is a combination of AP and IB. So in their humanities and a lot, and a lot of their social studies, some foreign languages, they've got IB courses everywhere. They've got 50 to 60% of their juniors and seniors taking IB courses. And some of the other courses, like uh, their departments of um, chemistry and physics, some of their math, uh, they've made department decisions to go more AP. So you, it's interesting in Missoula, because you've got three high schools. You've got Sentinel that's committed to AP. You've got Hellgate that's got both. And you've got Big Sky that's headed, if they can get there w with enough training and resources, uh, to be an IB, total IB high school in all departments. Um, so, and, and I think that's a nice definition of equity, personally. It doesn't all have to be the same. We talk about that equal and equity thing. And, and I think that gives parents some options. So I give that to you just for background as you kind of mull over this whole concept. Hey, Trustee Mercer, do you have a question? So I guess sort of a data request is, especially given that gap between that freshman and sophomore gap, do the kids that went through IB at elementary, do we see some payoff at IB in high school? And if not, especially Big Sky is not fed, right, by Washington, and that's gonna be our IB school, then what value, well, I mean, that's, that's too harsh, but it seems like if we're doing it in the elementary school, it should pay off in the, in the secondary school, and if it's not, if it's awash with other programs, then why are we spending on it, I guess? Um, <clears throat> my other question, I guess, I keep wondering is, when you say it has a better, you seem to be saying it has a better pedagogy, then why aren't we just we just doing that. Why isn't that our pedagogy if it's better? What, what do we, what is restrictive about it has to be IB to do those better things? Uh, and, and you can go ahead, but Dr. Guest, can you unshare your screen? And then go ahead and answer Cohen's question. My apologies. So uh, IB requires that you be part of the team. You've got to pay a license every year to belong to IB. You've got to go through their candidacy. You know, to some extent, you've got to play by their rules. And if you, to get training, you've got to go to IB certified trainings. We had a connection with the University of Montana three to four years ago. It was fabulous. Uh, the University of Montana is not able to provide that anymore. So now we're looking at trainings that are more expensive because we've got to travel much further to get those kinds of trainings. Um, I think I'm answering your question. And then my other question was data, and this is my request if, if you don't have it, data comparing elementary who didn't have IP to L IB to elementary who did have IB and then how that affects their IB experience in high school. We don't have that data. We'd have to go looking for that data. That would be something we'd have to take a lot of time to try and examine, follow cohort, cohorts of kids and try and come up with is there a significant difference I don't have that for you right now. Do you have that? No, but I think um, to add partly to that question is there was a lot of conversation with IVO, with the University of Montana in our task force around what do we value around IV and that notion of a pathway or not. And the thought, the thought process is, is, is with the pathway, it's a, it's a, it's a value statement, so it's a commitment to the essence of um, the IB pedagogy starting in elementary and how we embrace that in every level all the way through to the end of their experience here at MCPS. Um, or do we look at IB as something that rests at the high school level um, and it's part of our um, advanced offerings and and so forth. And so it, it really does open up to an interesting conversation that people shared in throughout this process around what is our, what is our connection or relation to IB around the pathway notion or if it rests just individually um, at these different levels. So um, it should be noted though that the, the students at Lewis and Clark wind up going to Sentinel. So they go Lewis and Clark, Washington, Sentinel. Are there any other trustee questions? Um, how about online? Um, I guess I have a, 
a couple of questions. One on, on the high school level, are the graduates expressing uh, disappointment that they're, they don't get some college credit for the IB classes as, like they would for AP? So that's one question. The other, I, I'm, and it's more like what Grace was talking about, we're talking about comparing you know, the IB school to other schools. I think it would be really important to know if the difference between our, our one IB school, how it was before IB and how it is now. Uh, essentially what were the problems that, at Lewis and Clark and has IB solved them? I think that's something we need to know um, rather than simply just this is neat, let's do it. You know, there had to have been some problems identified at Lewis and Clark that they thought could be solved through IB. And I, I guess that was before my time. So um, are there any... Uh, Again, we'd have to go back and talk to people at Lewis and Clark prior to IB and after IB. We haven't done that. So, but I understand what you're looking for, but we haven't, we haven't gone down that road right now. I think members in the task force um, that came from Lewis and Clark really spoke to a heightened level of pride around when, when schools were asked to, to initiate some of these innovative um, programming. The, the community at Lewis and Clark was very much excited and, and put their hand up first as far as we, we we're interested in doing um, IB, we want to explore this, we, we're all in. And that um, is something that definitely came out during the task force and in the empathy interviews. Um, and then you asked a question about college credit that definitely came out in our, our parent focus groups and in further conversations with the task force that it, um, much credit due to the work from Cameron Johnson and um, other leaders in this implementation of IB that there are colleges who provide credit for these courses where kids can enter into college at a sophomore standing, just similar to AP. Um, it depends on the colleges, but I think um, some of that has really changed in the last few years and, and families really spoke about how important it is for their students to to receive and earn the IB diploma and how that relates to sophomore standing and, um, and the amount of credits earned at the college level. And we also heard from those parents that IB really makes a difference trying to get into more competitive colleges, depending on where they wanna go, what they wanna do, because it's, um, it's well thought of. So that was very important to a lot of families when we talked to the parent focus groups. Did you, oh, Nancy, did you have a question? Oh, <laughs> I was hitting the wrong button. Um, Russ, I guess I was just wondering if that applies to students, high school students who just took the IB classes or who got, also got the diploma. There's a big difference in that about their ability to get into more competitive schools. I think it applies to both because we heard we heard a few stories where kids want to get in, want to get the IB diploma as a junior, and then there's there's some attrition because it's not easy. But the difference, but having a number of IB courses on your transcript made a difference. So even if you didn't sit and and make it through to get that diploma, the fact that you've uh, that you've had a, a number of courses on the transcript, people people thought highly of that. You know, I just also want to make mention of Franklin again because I, I owe them, <laughs> I owe them some time. That community also uh, re raised their hand, uh, and I don't know the story of Franklin that well because we didn't go get it, and maybe we need to go do that. Um, but uh, again, that was a community as well seeking an I to become an IB school, and then there's a variety of reasons why that didn't happen. But um, that's a story that I would like to double back on and be able to bring back to the board as well and work that we, uh, we would be glad to do. So I just wanna let you know. Okay, thanks. Is there any more, Colin, is that your hand? Yeah, I guess I just, the high school I can understand because there's an alternative and we can evaluate what AP is and that's an alternative. The elementary schools, the question to me is, should it be expanded to the other schools? And I don't know what, I don't feel I, I don't, I need more information. Like should, why, 
so the people like it where it is, but well then, should everybody else be allowed to raise their hand? I would think they should if they want. Um, and we should ask Russell whether it wants to raise its hand and get you know, $120,000 of support. Um, if it's good, then we should do that, right? It shouldn't be good just for the two schools that raised their hand seven years ago. I, I think, oh, go I, ahead. I think part of what Grace spoke to earlier around that history and, and what came out in the task force as well is that it's hard to gather some of the insights around that elementary piece because they're codependent with DL Iatt, um, at Paxson and our STEM programming. And it, be it becomes codependent on all the other um, innovative initiatives that were identified and implemented into individual schools. Um, and that was something that came out in the task force as we need, we need to spend more time reviewing other initiatives and how they either um, work symbiotically or competitively and, and what, what, what's happening with that relationship. Go ahead, Justine Mercer. So I guess that's my data question. What is at the other schools that don't have IB? I get Paxson, but keep going. Can you keep going? I'm not sure other schools have an equivalent. If they do, that would really be informative to me. And we can wait and put that in our board, what the board would like to know. You don't have to try that on the fly. I don't want to try it on the fly, but I'd surely like to look it up for you and come, and come back to you. And that's another reason why we scheduled a couple of meetings for this discussion. Okay, thanks. Uh, Grace? I'm really thankful for all of this discussion. And I think the, the um, this is maybe more of a comment. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so really this whole question of equity is just so central to what we're talking about. The whole question of equity meaning, as Russ said, it's not the same everywhere, but people get what they need and what works. And unfortunately, I think what has happened in Missoula is that our wealthier, more well-resourced, more vocal parents have supported specialized programming in their schools. And we want excellent programming for all of our kids in all of our schools. Um, but I think to, to take a look at what IB is like and the satisfaction that those parents feel at, um, say, Lewis and Clark as a for example, um, should really be a marching order to us as a district to make sure that every kid and every family at every school feel just as passionately about their school as kids might feel and families might feel at Lewis and Clark. That they can say, this is who we are and what we do and why we do it and we love it. And whether that means everyone does IB, I don't think is the case, but ev like every school should be able to have that pride. And unfortunately, these schools where the parents were able to organize and where there was bandwidth to do this work before the bond came along, um, unfortunately, our more well-resourced schools have become better resourced <laughs> over time in some ways because the, this funding that we're seeing on this page has supported that level of um, adoption of an excellent curriculum in their schools. So I think th the, the review of IB is one thing, but the review of what it means for our district is gonna be a much bigger conversation. Is there any other trustee comment? I, I guess I absolutely agree with Grace that we, it, you know, we are a district, we are one school with, with 12 buildings. We're not 12 separate schools and we have to do what's right for every child, whether their parent has the ability to, to tell us those things or the resources. Um, so I think we're done with the board comment portion and I think we'll open up to public comment. Um, Paul's gonna direct traffic on public comment and the, the rules apply, please keep it below three minutes. Don't name personal names or personal positions. Thank you. Jeb, you wanna spell your name and go ahead and unmute your mic? Yes, uh, Jeb Puryear, J-E-B, last name P-U-R-Y-E-A-R. -E I just wanted to make a couple of comments and this sort of all goes under the heading of the idea that this review is intended to be a template for reviews that would happen in the future. Um, let me also give the disclosure that I was involved and was talked to uh, in, in this process as being somebody that works at UM 
in the teaching and learning department, and I was an IB core diploma pro program coordinator for five years. So I have a lot of background uh, in how this program works. I would say though, the I, I have a little problem with the framing that like there was a lot of outreach on things because it took like three bits of contact on my part, even with that expertise and with having a kid who's a senior in the IB program to actually get talked to. So that was a little bit weird. Um, and there aren't really numbers on the parents of how many were talked to. That would be nice to see. I think that's something going forward for transparency purposes that would be good to know um, in final reporting of things. I just know that we never got asked. I don't remember there ever being uh, anything about it. Um, I also find it interesting that there was one diploma program student talked to or one, one IB program student talked to, uh, and that's a person at Big Sky. So no one at Hellgate was talked to as far as this data. And there's all these claims made about students say there's so much stress, but apparently this is based on one student when 80% of the people at Big Sky are taking these classes, at least one. So like, it seems like there would have been more to, you know, get information from. So I think, I think an awareness going forward that we should be really transparent on the processes of how people were selected who data was actually collected from, and then like making claims from the data itself. Um, things like the, the, the evidence only goes four out of five because you didn't have good enough evidence. Well, that's not the fault of the IB, right? That shouldn't reflect negatively on the IB program just because you don't have uh, the data. Uh, in terms of support, so there's a lot of talk of like, woe is me about funding when it's 60,000 of 490,000, so 12% of the money for IB is coming from this grant. And over the course of it on the sheet, it's only like 25%. So the idea that somehow the grant funding going away is gonna blow this up and there wouldn't be the money feels a little bit um, sketchy to me. And there's also weird data things like Lewis and Clark. I, I don't know why you can't just take the seven years before the IB came, look at what the trajectory of scores was and look at what the trajectory of scores are since they started the IB. That feels like I probably could go find that on like throw a government website of school reporting in five minutes. That's not a whole year long sort of thing. But I think being really upfront with people about where you're being the data and being open and honest and make claims that actually fit the data, that all sounds like I'm being very negative. The people that I talk to in this, in this district during this process know I am like a ginormous supporter of this program. Um, and my daughter just finished it and she's so excited that her testing is done. And really it's it's a great program we need to have it around for a lot of different reasons i just think we need to be more upfront and honest with people and we hear these comments from board members all the time in these meetings i just think we need to follow through on that okay thank you next paul sorry n i longing you want to go ahead and unmute your mic and Spell your name. This is Nick Loafing. L-O-F-I-N-G. I'm a parent at Franklin. I've got a fifth grader, a second grader, and a preschool preschooler who will be there soon. I've been the PTA president for the last three years. And I served with trustee old person on the elementary school redistricting study program. And I'm here tonight to ask you to not overlook this critical piece that's not been talked about here. And that is that our Spanish program at Franklin has been canceled. Our Spanish teacher, her contract has not been renewed. She's been told she doesn't have a job next year. And that's a critical piece to this conversation because it will be a long road before Franklin can even get back in the game of this IB conversation without the Spanish program. The PTA for years as this implemented followed the implementation of it. We supported it and we were celebrating it when it was announced that we had achieved the certification. And then almost simultaneously, we learned that it was going on pause. We didn't hear or know that it was going to be canceled 
or that that going on pause, whatever that means, was going to lead to cancellation. And I cannot overstate the black eye that the administration wears for two weeks ago, sending all of us parents an email that says the IB program is being canceled and we're losing our Spanish program. And there was outrage in our community. And that led to Mr. Lodge coming to our PTA meeting and hearing about it and then reversing the position on the IB program and saying it needs to be studied more and our input needs to happen. And he's worn that black eye again here tonight and that's important. What he hasn't told you and what hasn't been brought is that we're losing the Spanish program. And that's a critical piece and it's a piece that shouldn't be overlooked because you guys, you can study this for eons and it's, it's Franklin's out was left out of the picture originally and will continue to be or will be set way be far behind again if we don't have our Spanish program. You heard about a great process that was undertaken here tonight and Franklin School was completely excluded from that process. And I would challenge you to go back and listen to this program that's being recorded and listen to it from the perspective of a Franklin parent. And when you hear these words about inclusivity and comprehensive and opportunity, focus groups with parents and, and students, you all you hear from the perspective of a Franklin parent is a lot of lip service. There's no need to further study Franklin's need to have a continued Spanish program for these purposes. Sure, there's lots of time, there's lots of study that needs to happen, support them to go out to the administration and the, and the teachers who are trying to implement this but what can't happen tonight is you can't let Franklin's Spanish program go by the wayside while this gets studied for it. It's a, it was a flawed process. And it's a, okay. the substantive decision-making that was happened is just as flawed. Okay. There's easy calls in the world and there's close calls. Yeah. This is a, not an easy call for you to make. And I'm asking you to tell the administration to find the funding to keep Spanish, the Spanish at Franklin. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and, I, and I guess other members of the Spanish, of the Franklin PTA, uh, we, we welcome your input. And because uh, I, I think there's a lot of you here. So let's, um, let's not go over our three minutes. Thanks. Katie, you want to spell your name and unmute? Sure. My name is Katie DeGranfre. First name K A T I E, last name D E, capital G R A N D P R E. I'm a Spanish teacher at Big Sky High School, and I had the honor of participating on the IB task force. It was very difficult. It was a lot of work. Um, and I want to thank um, Dr. Guest and um, Mr. Lodge for um, leading us through that process. Um, I just wanted to quickly speak to um, I actually want to speak to three questions, but I think um, between um, Mr. Lodge and Dr. Guest, they handled kind of how the task force dealt with our concerns around equity very well. Um, but I wanted to speak specifically to a question, and I apologize because I can't remember who asked it, um, about why, if the IB pedagogy is so good, why is it not just our pedagogy? Why do we not just use it? And the answer is actually, um, that came out of the task force is that um, IB provides accountability for teachers to follow good teaching practices. And you might say, well, why shouldn't teachers hold themselves accountable? And the answer is yes, but part, a big, big, big part of that accountability is feedback that teachers get from IB. So at the end of every year, you get, you get comments on your teaching from IB. So it's not just a one-way thing. IB is very much a two-way conversation year after year. And that really 
supports teachers who are IB and really bolsters the teaching. And that's what we pay for when we pay for IB fees. Additionally, we pay for training whenever we can get to go to training. And those trainings are some of the best professional development out there. Um, and, and at the elementary level, and I know there are elementary people here who want to speak to this, but um, at the elementary level, they submit um, inquiry, units of inquiry, and they get feedback on those units of inquiry. So that's why it's really hard to do IB without being part of IB, um, because we get coaching and feedback on our teaching. Um, and that's all. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, next one. Anna, you want to go ahead and spell your name and unmute your mic? Yes, Anna Purrier, A-N-N-A-P-U-R-Y-E-A-R. I want to start by saying thank you to the task force. Amazing work. I want to thank all of the IB teachers and coordinators and administrators at Big Sky High School as we do have a graduate graduating with the IB diploma in just a couple of days. And it's because of their hard work along with hers on um, getting it done in this crazy time. Um, that being said, I just want to uh, reiterate how wonderful a program this is, especially at the IB, uh, at the high school level. Um, we've lived in many places in the most recent years. Um, we've never lived or worked at a school that did not offer IB. It has always been our plan to send our children to IB schools. So knowing that Missoula had two options for us to look at when we came here was a big draw and made me feel secure as a parent that my goals for my children were going to be met. In addition, it is a um, very rigorous program if you go through the diploma program, also very rigorous if you take individual classes. There aren't a whole lot of other options really at all at Big Sky if you're an advanced learner. Um, this is the second time I've spoken about advanced learners tonight, and that's because I live with one and I want her supported. I also live with two children who have dyslexia, who I intend to be in the IB diploma because it is inclusive and supportive of all learners. Um, I appreciate all of the work. I do think that there needs to be a whole community understanding of what IB is. Every person I talk to, whether it's a coworker, a community member, or people who have children in the schools, they don't know what IB is. And that is a disservice to our community. If we have this wonderful program and it's a choice to go to Big Sky or to Hellgate to receive it, the entire community needs to know what it's about and how it supports their children at their house. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next. Topher, you want to go ahead and spell your name and unmute your mic? Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Topher Lenher. T-O-F-F-E-R-L-E-H-N-H-E-R-R. -E -R -R. And um, I'm a parent of a kindergartner at uh, Franklin. And um, he's our only child. And this is um, our, first, our first year in the public school system. And um, the Spanish teacher that Nick mentioned, um, if, if by how much my son talks about his, his teachers and the people that care for him during the day. Um, the Spanish teacher is by far the teacher he talks about voluntarily. And so learning that her position was, was cut because of this IB review is um, hard to take just, just to try to explain to him why, why one of his favorite teachers won't be back at the school next year. Um, and I'd also like to comment that the, the community at Franklin, there's a lot of us here tonight we were shocked at this decision and how it was communicated at us. Um, and I, I just think that Franklin community is such a great resource um, that's being underutilized by the school district. Um, there have been other, other parents um, and teachers at the school that I've been able to call and text with to inform me about this history as a kindergarten parent. I don't, I don't know all the history and I've been really appreciative that our school has has been willing to share their their um, experiences with me, and I think that they would love to participate in the process going forward. And and to that end, I think when we talk about equity at Franklin, we need to look at things like the community school model that is being developed at Lowell, and how those types of resources 
can be distributed um, across our, our school communities um, so that those type of resources, ones that are providing you know, food and um, healthcare services, that those things can be um, parks and rec programming, that those things can be brought to, to another school. I think that's a conversation that we would love to have with you all. And, and I, I hope that this conversation, as hard as it is, um, leads to those, those better conversations um, about things that we can do to, to support our kids and our families at this uh, at Franklin and across our district. So thank you for your time tonight. I really appreciate um, you discussing this and listening. Thank you very much. Um, next. Dina, you want to go ahead and unmute your mic and spell your name? Hi, I'm Dina Mansour, D-E-E-N-A-M-A-N-S-O-U-R. And I'm speaking tonight as the parent of a student uh, who graduated two years ago from Hellgate and took a selection of IB classes. I have a daughter who had intended to be an IB diploma student who's graduating now, and as someone who's worked in international education for 30 years. Let me tell you that the IB program is a phenomenal program that is specifically designed to support students of all backgrounds, all incomes, all races. And I have a lot of research that I'm going to submit for your next um, meeting in public comment that, de that demonstrates the importance of IB programs for a wide demographic. I'll also tell you my son, who's a sophomore in college, was able to waive two of his three quarters because of his IB classes. Um, I will also tell you my experience in the last two years with my daughter at Hellgate and why she did not complete the IB diploma. Um, when you spoke very glowingly of the results of your task force, let me first say that the four Hellgate teachers on that task force are phenomenal, that they work hard, they provide amazing content, and they provide your students the education they need to go on and be successful. So kudos to those teachers. And also to the teachers I've experienced at Big Sky High School, because we were told by Hellgate High School that we should go pursue math because Hellgate couldn't support us at Hellgate, so we should go to Big Sky. So... When you look at your focus groups, I want to echo what your first speaker said. There were no Hellgate speakers, no, no Hellgate students that your task force spoke to. There was one Big Sky High School teach, student. When we heard that the parents at Hellgate were being spoken to, the group of IB diploma parents were like talking amongst ourselves because we had not been contacted. We found out that there was one IB diploma family that had been contacted, but they couldn't make it to the focus group. So you have a significant component of people who have been deep immersed in IB for the last two years who were not spoken with. Um, I will tell you that, yes, if you want to talk about positives across the board in terms of curriculum, it is phenomenal. But in terms of school culture and capacity at Hellgate, it's nearly non-existent this year. That you took a very strong IB coordinator and you replaced it with someone with no training. And that's Excuse why my daughter me, we, we did not get, achieve her diploma this We can't year. get personal, um, please. I would say that IB is not thriving at Hellgate. I will tell you we had a principal who came in five years ago and said, me, we're going to we remove AP rest. classes because we don't have sufficient um, space for... Um, Excuse me, ma'am, please, with the personal stuff. Thank you. Um, is any, I guess we just move on then, Russ. Not Russ. Paul? I'm sorry, was, was I muted or did I mute myself? Well, well we, we were concerned at how close you were coming to, to, to personal stuff, with personal people. Um, so, so I think we muted you. Oh, okay. All right. Well, if I can speak more broadly that IB is not thriving at Hellgate, um, that we have had our challenges there, and I hope that you will consider that, and I will submit written comments. So thank you. thanks for hearing us out. Dakota, you want to go ahead and unmute your mic and spell your name? Hi, uh, I'm Dakota Knight. My last name is N-Y-G-H-T. Uh, I have a first grader and a fifth grader who are both currently in MOA, but our homeschool is Franklin. And I'm commenting tonight to ask the board to direct administration to retrain Franklin's Spanish program. Um, there's a lot of known benefits for foreign languages, students who participate in it, including improved academic performance, better career opportunities down the line, um, more stimulated, critical, balanced view of the world. Um, I think all of you 
are probably really aware of those uh, benefits. And it, and she, it uh, helps students close achievement gaps. And, you know, I'm not intimately familiar with the performance scores at every school, but Franklin is a Title I school, and it seems to me like those benefits would be especially beneficial for our students there. Um, I understand that our Spanish program has been cut because uh, our International Baccalaureate program has been recommended for cutting. And as a lot of people have uh, mentioned, we were not included in that conversation. And um, one comment I also want to make is that equity was mentioned a lot in the presentation, but and I, I realize that the word uh, floated in its definition to, to borrow Mr. Lodge's term, but um, these evaluations look like they were really all made with data and people from economically advantaged schools, which Franklin is not. And so the process seems really quite inequitable ultimately. So regardless of all that, I'm actually not advocating for the retention of the IB program at this point, because my understanding is that it's really onerous for our teachers who are also working to do a lot of intervention with our kids who are coming from these disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, I will say I'm disappointed that my children are not gonna have the chance to participate in all of the advantages that an IB program has. Um, but I would like to ask for our Spanish program to stay. Uh, we don't even have the option to continue with IB in the future if we don't have a Spanish program. And um, it, you know, in the interest of equity between schools and in advocating for the disadvantaged students at Franklin, I'm asking for that. So, and specifically for our teacher. So thank you. Maria Hill, you wanna unmute your mic and spell your name? Sure, my name is Maria Hill, M-A-R, I-A-H, last name H-I-L-L. -L. And I'm a parent at Franklin Elementary. I have a fifth grader, a second grader, um, and a future kindergartner. And I'm also very concerned. I found it almost painful to sit through Assistant Superintendent Lodges and Dr. Guest's presentation. What a phenomenal... Oh, did I do that? Wait. Mariah, it seems like you've muted yourself. Mariah, we'll come back to you. Uh, Sherry, if you want to go ahead and unmute your mic and spell your name. Uh, Sherry, S-H-E-R-R-Y, Winter, W-I-N-T-E-R. I am a kindergarten teacher at Lewis and Clark. I was also on the IB task force for this um, very intense process of evaluating this program. Um, I do want to, there's something that I wanted to say that in, in history, I have been a part of this process from the get-go. And I wanted to give some background that at Lewis and Clark, the reason we became an IB school is because a teacher came to us and said, one of our fellow colleagues said, hey, Hellgate's doing IB program. They now have a new PYP program. We should do it. And it took a big process for the staff to come to consensus, but it wasn't challenging. It was 100% consensus that we wanted to take on this pretty cumber cumbersome uh, program. When we say that it needs that, I totally agree. One of our things when Dr. Apostle had allowed this opportunity for schools to be their own little thing, the goal and the hope was for more elementary schools to grab onto the IB program. That is what was the hope. I was on that team from the very beginning with Dr. Apostle, Karen Allen, and people from my school. It is an amazing program. It's not something you can really compare to see what high schoolers from a PYP school in, in Missoula look like compared to a non-PYP school because they're not there yet. So for kiddos that are in sixth grade right now, they're the first ones to get a full six years of IB education. And my fifth grader is one of those kiddos. My son was one of the kiddos that spoke in front of the task force. And one of the discussions we had on the task force were how articulate those kids were, how 
they could name every part of the IV program. They could are, hold their own with a group of adults, grilling them with questions. It's an amazing program that I would hate to see go away because we don't feed into a high school that has IB because IB is producing amazing learners. And again, back to that whole equity piece, it wasn't the parents that asked Lewis and Clark teachers to teach IB. It was the teachers who said, yes, let's give it a try. And it's been a success because 100% of our staff are bought, are, have bought in. We're a grassroots school. So it's really challenging to start to tell a school you have to be IB because it is not easy. It is challenging, but worth the work. 100,000%. I'd go back and do it over again. And I am hoping my third grader doesn't get IB cut and doesn't get their Spanish cut like Franklin. I'm really sad that that's happening. So I am hoping, hoping of all hope that this can continue. Thank you for your time. And thank you for allowing me to be part of that task force. I really appreciate it. Kat Berry, you want to unmute your mic and spell your name? Hello, this is Kat Berry, K-A-T, last name B-A-R-R-Y. I am a parent at Franklin Elementary, and I am asking you for three things. To please reinstate the contract for our Spanish teacher for the upcoming academic year. To please reinstate the contract or position for the IB coordinator. And to allow us to do the review that we missed out on during the last year. Thank you. Brenda, you want to unmute your mic and spell your name? Good evening. I'm Brenda Solorzano, B-R-E-N-D-A-S-O-L-O-R-Z-A-N-O. -O -O Appreciate the opportunity to comment. Um, I have some uh, suggestions that I would love for the board members to consider. The first is to really think about what data do you need to make decisions about the future of the IV program in the Missoula schools? Um, I echo the comments that there was not wide participation by Hellgate High School students that were pre that was previously made. I was part of the parent focus group. I can tell you that there were only two parents on that conversation, and I cannot I cannot believe that I could adequately speak for the totality of all parent perspectives um, in the Missoula School District. Second of all, I would encourage you to think about. Um, the IB program is something that could be a benefit for all students in the Missoula School District. Many BIPOC students who are given an opportunity to participate in these kinds of programs are the ones that actually break the cycle of poverty. Third, I would request that the school district and the school site administrators do no harm to students, that they hold on making decisions about the future of programs avail coming available for students this coming academic year until the school district has made a decision so that students are not harmed in the process. And third, I would encourage you to think about innovative approaches to funding, creating partnerships and collaborations that actually benefit not only the IV program, but of all of our students in the Missoula School District. Thank you. Chair McDonald, did you have a comment? It's Vicki, Trustee Vicki McDonald. Do you have your hand up? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I just, I just um, had a question that I just wanted to throw out here. It's, I was just wondering um, how has, how or has the IB task force um, had any conversation with um, Big Sky on uh, the proposed academy classes that are also amazing. Um, it has amazing benefits for students, but is that tying in together or um, because I, I understood that the remodeling and the construction um, at Big Sky was kind of designed for um, some future academy classes. And so I was just wondering if that has been any or part of the conversation with the IB task force. And Vicki, um, thanks for the question. We'll put it in our data request uh, for next time. It's it's a little bit okay. off, off okay. agenda. Okay, it, it was just kind of a comment and a question. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Lacey, you want to unmute your mic and spell your name? My name's Lacey Rathbun, 
L-A-C-I-R-A-T-H-B-U-N. I'm also a Franklin parent. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that although we, we received an apology from Mr. Lodge and um, assurance at the beginning of this meeting that nothing is off the table and, you know, that um, conversations about IB continuation at our school can continue, that seems unlikely when a determination to cut our Spanish teacher has already happened. Um, and so I think like everyone else, I don't know that I can advocate for the IB program at this point in time. I don't know that it's a good fit for our school, um, but I would like to be given the opportunity to explore that, to explore what would make it a good fit. And the option that, um, that Spanish is something that is gonna be very hard for us to get back if we lose it, specifically with this teacher. Um, and that, you know, we were told a few different reasons why Spanish may be cut, even regardless of the IB program. Some of it was um, that we may have to choose between having Spanish or art, which seems like apples and oranges to me. Um, and that Spanish is not something that we can compensate with local nonprofits help or with teacher classroom involvement. Spanish is something that requires a specific curriculum and a specially trained teacher, which we currently have. Um, and I just feel that it would be a big disadvantage to our students. So if options really are on the table, um, I would really encourage you guys to um, help us look for different possibilities and ways that we can continue to support the students at Franklin because we don't have a large, um, a large voice and we are, we are a more disadvantaged school and um, we, don't, we don't necessarily know how to make headway on this. And so we're gonna really rely on the administration and the board um, to help us find some creative solutions. Thank you. NJ, you want to unmute your mic and Hi. spell your name? This is Mariah Hill. I'm going to try my, I'm sorry, my Zoom connection there. Is it okay if I try to speak again? Yes. Did you say it's Mariah Hill again? Yes, this is Mariah Hill. I'm going to try to speak from my husband. Okay. I lost connection. I apologize. Thank you. Okay. Do you want me to spell my name again? No, I think we're good. Okay, thank you. I'm a parent at Franklin. I have two children there and one future kindergartner. I'm a four-year member of the PTA. And I'm very distressed about the exclusion of Franklin from the IB review process. The process that Assistant Superintendent Lodge and Dr. Guest described sounds phenomenal. It's painful to sit through that presentation as a Franklin parent because all I can think about with every one of Dr. Guest's slides is how valuable that would have been to our school community. How awful it is that at the end of this very meaningful, very well thought out process, that we weren't invited to the table. And the conclusion of that process was uh, Assistant Superintendent Lodge meeting with our teachers to let them know that the IV program had been canceled and we were losing our Spanish teacher. The teachers asked him, have you even let parents know? No, I guess I better do that. The parents got an email the, the, the week after that. That was just two weeks ago. And then he did come to our PTA meeting, which we very much appreciated. But what an afterthought. What an afterthought we are to this process. There's nothing equitable about how this went down. And it's very suspect. I, I feel like we have to start over because how can you rely on the findings of a task force Four schools out of five were represented. I would like to point out that one of those schools is only in candidacy for IB, whereas Franklin has been fully authorized as an IB program, and we were still excluded from the process. And those four schools and their task force and the representatives from the central office want to propose that IB be fully funded by the school district for those four schools. And because Franklin didn't really fit into that picture and we had no voice, how easy to just let us go and not really expect much of a response. I appreciate Assistant Superintendent apologies, which he's made several now, but I want, it, I want more than an apology. I want action. I want to know how this exclusive and inequitable process is going to be remedied. I want to know how we can reinstate the Spanish language program at Franklin, and I want to know when we get to engage in this kind of meaningful conversation, open door process with parents and teachers. 
there was some there was some kind of conversations behind closed doors with Franklin teachers last year, but parents were not included in that, and it wasn't a process where people could safely say, "I'm struggling, I need help, I'm running into challenges." It was, "Are you in or are you out?" If you find it hard. That's a, that's a sign of lack of staff buy-in, and we're not going to support this program at a district level anymore. How wonderful that Lewis and Clark parents and Big Sky and Helgi and Washington parents can say, here's the barriers we're finding to implementing the program. I saw that question in the presentation. Th thank you very much, And find much, ways to Michelle. support that. We didn't have that opportunity. When we said we're having some barriers, they said, let's put your program on hold. And then when nobody's really looking two years later, let's just make it quietly go away. Okay. That is inequitable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. It's unconscionable, really, what happened. And I want to know what the remedy is. I don't want any more apologies. I want action. Okay. Thank you. Is that our last one? Okay. We don't see any other public comment at this time. Um, thank everybody for their input on this. I think. Um, the board has work to do. We need to communicate to the administration some clear guidelines on this issue. Um, so I appreciate the information item provided and I appreciate the, the work and the risk that Russ and at least took and uh, I think we all, it was a difficult year. So I think, uh, you know, we just have some more work to do. Um, so I guess with that, um, is anyone, is there any objection to adjourning? Oh, okay, Grace has a comment. I want you to know, I, I oh, more, pub, okay. I, I did discuss with um, with our attorney, Bia, how I could sort of ease up on the, the restrictiveness of the agenda. That's why I'm saying, so, so at this point, rather than just adjourning, I'm gonna ask, is there any reason not to adjourn? But yeah, you're right, we do take public, well, we took it out of there, uh, but, because in my experience in eight years, I'd never seen anyone come in at the end of the agenda. So is there any objection to adjourning with the trustees? All right, thank you. <laughs> We're adjourned. Sorry.